Okay, hey guys, how are you? I hate YouTube. Yeah, I'm Sheikh of Father, so my spirit watch my God, my Savior King, Lord Jesus Christ. Hold on, guys. I kept looking. I'm trying to look for a live stream, and I couldn't find it. Now that I'm live, now I see it. It, it YouTube, man, my goodness. Yeah, Lord Father, so my spirit, in Jesus, Almighty name, Lord Father, so my spirit. Guys, say a prayer in your hearts that. The Lord Jesus Christ will wash us in his holy blood and the Holy Spirit will fill us to glorify our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, Father, and Son, Spirit, in Jesus, Almighty name. So because of YouTube, I got to now post the links on my Facebook page. Sorry about that. Eat the flesh, drink the blood of my God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Eat the flesh and drink the blood of my God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, Father, and Spirit. And I'm going to call this guy the real Mustafa, the Father, Father, and Spirit. Pray that his, his Skype connection, his internet connection is strong. So for the glory of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the real Mustafa. The Lord the Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus, Almighty name. The Lord the Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus, Almighty name. Watch me, God, my Savior, King, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's begin. Please, my God, watch me, God, my Savior, King, Lord Jesus Christ. I hate YouTube. We love you, Father. Son of God, Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Holy Spirit, sanctify us, purify us in the blood of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Cleanse us. Crucify our flesh. Forgive us when we fail and give us the power, strength from you to overcome our flesh, our sinful passions, to walk in union with you. Fill us with might, with the fruit of your presence, with love and joy and holiness and boldness that our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus, the Father's heart, his Son will increase in us. Anoint me to speak truth clearly. Save me from error, stammering and confusion and not to shame the name of my God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, but to glorify the eternal Son of God, our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, by your power, Holy Spirit, guide this conversation and sanctify us and convict this man, chasten this man to fear the Lord Jesus and bow before the feet of Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. Son of God, we need you. Bless us and our loved ones, my daughters. Wash us in your blood, Lord Jesus. And Father, we need you. We love you, Abba. We love your Son. We love your Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name. Wash me in God, my Savior, King, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, guys, invite folks. Let's see if he's going to pick up. Okay, you there, my friend? Hello, is my mic working? Beautiful, man. Your mic is doing good. Uh, you got the wrong guy last, last That's okay. time. I was an imposter. Him. That was not me. No, actually, I confused him. He didn't say you're Mustafa. I thought because he was making comments that was similar to the comments you're making in the comment section. So I got him confused with you. His name is Muhammad Sharif. It was my fault. So may the Lord Jesus Christ save me from error and stammering and sin. And may increase in us in Jesus' almighty name by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's okay. You're the real Mustafa. So that's good. Yes. Now that's good you're listening to my session because like I said to the other guy thinking it was you, you were very insulting and rude. So if you're going to do that, then gloves are off. So if you respect your prophet, chapter 6, verse 108, watch your tongue and how you talk. Because every time you say something to insult my God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to humiliate Muhammad. So take your... Quranic verse, chapter 6, verse 108. Do you have your Quran? Yes. Read it. Chapter 6, verse 108. Let's see how faithful of a Muslim you are. Do you really fear Allah and love his messenger? Let's see. 6, 108. Chapter 6, verse 108. This will be a test to see if you really believe in Islam. Uh, chapter 6, verse 108. Yes. And do not insult those they invoke other than Allah, lest they insult Allah in enmity without knowledge. Thus we have made pleasing to every community their deeds. Then to their Lord is their return, and he will inform them about what they used to do. Okay, so if you truly fear Allah and believe Muhammad, you don't insult my God, the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God that I believe in, or the Bible, because I'm going to desecrate your Quran and insult Allah and Muhammad. So do you believe your Quran? Yes. Okay, so you're not going to insult. You're not going to blaspheme, so I don't have to insult Muhammad and bury him, right? No. You can ask questions, and you can answer questions. I don't care about objections, but what you are doing in the comment section, 
making fun, insulting, ridiculing the Bible, making fun of us, you're asking for it, and you wonder why Christians then hate Muhammad and insult your God because of Muslims like you. So respect your Quran, keep it respectful, right? I'm always just mad because uh, David Wood and you are always insulting Islam and, and mocking the Prophet. So, so uh, it works both ways. Well, no, let's go back in history. See, I'm going to correct you. You're lying again. I didn't begin insulting Islam. Islam began insulting me when Muslims attacked me and my Bible said, my Bible's corrupt, it's full of porn. I didn't start it, you Muslims did. And you Muslims came later and started attacking us Christians, starting with your very Quran. So don't go there. Don't play victim. Don't play, you know, poor little me. This is what narcissists do. Narcissists attack, vilify, ridicule people. But when then people stand up to the narcissist, narcissist oh, why'd you do that? Poor me. I'm the victim. Why, me, me, me. We don't play that game here. Narcissistic personality disorder is from the pit of hell, and the Lord Jesus destroy it for his glory. It doesn't work with me. All right? So now you're ready. So you wanted to talk about a variety of topics. We talked about what the Quran says in the Bible. You went on the Trinity. We talked about Trinity. You went on the Bible. So what do you want to talk about right now? Um, does the Quran confirm the Bible? Shoot your best shot. Give me your verses from your Quran. Okay. Um, I'm assuming you've listened to all our sessions and read our articles. We've, we've addressed every single passage that you may come up with to try to prove the Quran teaches the Bible's corrupt. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 79. Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 78. Surah Al-Maidah, chapter 5, verses 13 and 15. And on and on it goes. So I hope you're not going to make the foolish mistake of quoting those verses again because you're going to end up embarrassing yourself. But go ahead. Shock me. Shock me. Okay. I, what I want to say is the Quran um, does not confirm the Bible, but at the same time, it does. And also, I'm the Quran is speaking. Hold on. Why? Before you move on, Mustafa, take it step at a time so people hear you. So you're saying that the Quran is like a schizophrenic person that says two things in contradiction. It does and it doesn't. Okay, it makes sense. What verses that you can point to to show me the Quran doesn't confirm it? I, um, the verse, um, Quran chapter 5, verse 47, is, is the verse that you um, and David like quoting. Mm -hmm. I would um, like uh, to use this verse. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, what does the verse, verse say? Read it. Read it. And, and let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. Now, there's some. Now, there's something that I want to point out. This is not. I'm referring to all people or Muslims. As it says, let the people of the gospel. Which people so at what time? The people of Which the gospel. people at what time? Uh, Breathe, I know you're indeed. nervous. Which people at what time? What time frame? What time period? Uh, during the time of the Prophet. Good. Okay, now that's the first point, right? And so he's talking to the Christians of his time saying, judge by the gospel. You start at 47. What gospel... Were those Christians at Muhammad's time to judge by, according to the context of Surah Al-Maidah? They were to judge by their gospel. What? Their what is it? It's to, you're told in the in the in the surah, so you don't need to guess. Don't give me your opinion. In the surah you quoted, it didn't start at forty-seven. What gospel were they supposed to judge by, according to the context of that very surah, surah that you quoted? It's right there. They were They were to judge by um, what Allah had revealed. What gospel? I'm going to ask it a third time, Mustafa. You're going to do the tap dance. You're going to make me now really go for the juggler, and I'm trying to be kind with you. 47 is not the beginning of the context. The beginning of the context of that particular section is 43. So I'm going to give you another chance to show me what gospel is 47 referring to. Read the context. You know what context is, right? Do I need to so, tell you the context? Just tell me. Uh, uh, Sam, help me with the, what the context is. I'll give it to you. 
uh, chapter 5, verse uh, um, 43. That's part of the context. The verse before 47. Now read 46 and 47. Now let's get the picture. You start at 47 conveniently, but start 46 and 47. Okay, verse 46. And we sent following in their footsteps, Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming that which came before him in the Torah. And we gave him the gospel, and which was guidance and light, and confirming that which preceded it of the Torah as guidance and, and instruction for the righteous. Now read and, 47. When you finish it, keep going. And let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. And what? And whoever. In the gospel. What gospel? The gospel of Jesus. Oh, thank you. Now you're being honest. Now I'm starting to respect you as a young man who is honest and fears God enough not to lie. So you notice they're to judge by the gospel giving to Jesus. You just said this is referring to the Christians at Muhammad's time, right? Yes. So now pray tell <clears throat> what was the gospel of Jesus that they had? Because it's saying... The gospel we gave to Jesus, you Christians of Muhammad's time, judge by it. So what was the gospel of Jesus that they had? Uh, the gospel of Jesus um, is basically um, the gospel that we have um, um, right now, on um, today. Say it again. The gospel of Jesus um, is what um, Jesus had spoken, right? And so what um, did the Christians have? It says they had the gospel. So what did they have? They had the Bible. Say it again. They had the Bible. So why is your Quran confirming that what they had, what you just said is the Bible, is the gospel given to Jesus? Um, the Quran, um, well, um, the gospel of Jesus is what um, Jesus had spoken, right? So, um, and so what did they have in 547? So people is, in 547, the Christians of Muhammad's time have Jesus' gospel. How do they have it? Jesus' gospel. Is, and they had uh, it, right? Is what Jesus Okay. Yeah, we, you keep repeating that point, and I got it the first 50,000 times. Let me ask the question the 10th time. 547 says they had the gospel that Jesus spoke. How did they have it? Well, um, when you look in the Bible, right, Jesus says um, to John um, to believe in the gospel, right? And the gospel was not even... What gospel did the Christians so, have that your prophet said is the gospel of Jesus and they're supposed to judge by? Don't tell me what Jesus preached. I'm asking you now the fourth time. 547 says to the Christians, judge by the gospel of Jesus that you have. You still didn't answer the question. What did they have that your prophet said is the gospel of Jesus? They, they had the Bible. Okay, so now you just again proved my Bible is the gospel that Jesus spoke that was written down and preserved by God. Thank you. Uh, no, because... Um, yes, because of 547. Of verse, five, okay. It and says, now you want to read 548? Um, judge by what? Yeah, I know the verse. Let the people of the gospel judge by God, what God revealed in it. In it? He revealed something in it. What's in it? What is the in it? What's the it? That he revealed. Okay. Um, this um, is based on the tafsir by Ibn Abbas. I could care less uh, if it's Ibn Maymun, the son of monkey. Ibn Abbas is not the Quran. Give me the Quran 547. Because then I'm going to give you Bukhari who explains Ibn Abbas and shows that you are ignorant or a liar. Stick with the Quran before we go to Ibn Abbas so I can use Ibn Abbas to embarrass you. 547 is clear. Where does 547 say the gospel they had is corrupt? Okay, I'm going to give you a um, verse from the Quran. Good. To prove. Give it to me. Um, Ibn Abbas. Okay, so. Give me the verse from um, the Quran so I can embarrass you. Go ahead. In the Quran, chapter 3, verse um, 7, 
I'm three I'm seven. Yes. I'm you sure you, you sure you want to quote that? Because I'm gonna really embarrass Muhammad right yes. now. Think twice. I'm gonna give you a chance to think yes. about it before you quote three seven. I'm gonna quote it. Okay. So can you tell me why the first eighty three verses of Surah Al Imran were revealed according to now? Because you like Ibn Abbas, Tabari Ibn Kathir Qurtubi. Surah Al Imran, the first eighty three verses, including verse seven, were quote unquote revealed for what reason? Do you know the reason? I I haven't um, looked it up yet. Oh so. wait 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 wait. Let me understand this clear. You're going to use chapter 3, verse 7, which you don't even know why it was supposedly revealed to try to refute me. And you don't even know why it's revealed, right? Do you want me to give you the links to show you that Ibn Kathir and Tabari and Qurtubi say that the first 83 verses were revealed to respond to the Christians from Najran, the Najrani Christians, the Nasara, who came to your prophet, debated him, and asked him questions that he could not answer. And then Surat al-Imran, the first 83 verses were sent to answer their objections. So now read chapter 3, verse 7 clearly, because I'm going to turn it against you. Read it clearly. Chapter 3, verse 7. Okay, but um, it still um, applies, okay? We're going to see if it's going to apply, because you're going to bury yourself. Because the unclear verses, <laughs> let me tell you why. It says the unclear verses, no one know their meaning except Allah. So how do you know what they mean, and how does Ibn Abbas know what it means when only Allah knows what it means? You see, I'm going to embarrass you, but read it. No, now listen. I uh, only um, Allah knows it's true. In, in, in and so Ibn Abbas right? knows it's false meaning. Okay. Right? So only Allah knows okay. the true meaning, and Ibn Abbas knows the false meaning. Good. Okay, that makes sense. Read no, the verse. No. Okay. Um, read I'm the Allah, verse. Okay. Um, when. Read the um, verse. This is three um, times I said. Um, read the verse. As, Read the verse. When, um, Ibn Abbas. Read the verse. This is now four times. Read the verse. This verse. Okay. Read the I'll verse. Say, I'm going to count to 10. Nine. 10, 9, 8. Open chapter 3. Read the verse. Read it. You mentioned it. Now read it. <clears throat> All right, uh, chapter 3, verse 7. Mm -hmm. It is he who, who has sent down to you, O Muhammad, the book. In it are verses that are precise. They are the foundation of the book, and others are unspecific. As for those in whose hearts is deviation from the truth, they will follow that of it which is unspecific, seeking discord and seeking an interpretation suitable to them. And no one knows its, its true interpretation except Allah. But those firm in knowledge, in knowledge say, we believe in it, all of it is from our Lord. And no one will be reminded except those of understanding. Okay, now I want to ask you some questions about the verse before you tap dance and run to Ibn Abbas. How many people know what those unspecific verses mean according to the verse? Okay. So you're not answering my question directly. So you're not doing it again. You're playing. You're doing what Muhammad does. Run away. I'm going to ask you the question a second time. How many people know the meaning of those unspecific verses according to what you just read? Okay. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, said, um, wait, hold on. This is now, you see it's so easy and you're still tap dancing. I'm going to ask you a third time. The verse in front of your eyes, how many people know the meaning of those unspecific verses according to the verse? It's right in front of you. Um, and so uh, no, okay. um, Surah Yusuf, 3 7. I'm um, going to embarrass you if you do the tap dance. 3 7. How many people know the verse? How many people know the verse, those unspecific verses according to what you just read? This is the fourth time I'm going to embarrass Muhammad. Don't make me insult Muhammad. Fear Allah. Answer your verse. How many people know the meaning of those unspecific verses according to what you just read? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah... Um, Joseph. Okay, do you see what this guy just did? You see what he did? He went to chapter 3, verse 7. He ran. Fifth time before I prove Muhammad is a pedophile 
rapist whore. I'm going to now ask you again. According to chapter 3, verse 7, which you just read, how many people know the meaning of the unspecific verses? The Prophet وسلم, and then companions. So the, the bastard Muhammad who raped women and treated them like whores, like your mother, didn't teach you to fear Allah by and reading the verse? Six 12, times. Verse six, how six, many six, six, people know Jews the unspecific? You stupid, dumb bastard. I piss on Muhammad. You see? There you go. That's that little punk, that spiritual demonic bastard who's acting tough in David Wood's comment section. You got it now? That was that kid, Mustafa, the real Mustafa. You see, they can't answer their Quran, right? How many times do you need to ask a spiritual bastard who believes in Allah and his messenger, how many people know the unspecific verses according to what you read? How many times you got to ask? Okay. This was that little punk kid, Mustafa, who was running his mouth against David Wood and me, insulting the Bible, insulting Jesus, and insulting us. And then they wonder why we hate Muhammad and despise him and call him a filthy, wicked whore of the devil, a pedophile, woman raping, woman whoring, whore of the devil who's burning in hell. Glory to Jesus Christ. Do you wonder why now? Do you wonder why? Okay. How many times do I need to ask this guy? Right? How many times? He quotes chapter 3, verse 7, and he wants to go to another passage. Okay? Did I quote chapter 3, verse 7? No. He did. And he runs from chapter 3, verse 7. Okay? Mustafa, get out of here. You are a coward. You're a disgrace to Islam. Well, actually, you're just wicked and filthy like Muhammad. So let's now remove you from here. Get out of here. All right. There you go. Chapter 12, verse 6. How does chapter 12, verse 6 explain 3, 7? Anyway, little punk. Blaspheme Jesus, attack Jesus, attack the Bible, and then attack us. All right, anyway. Sorry, guys. That's what it is. They run their mouths off, and they're a waste of time. Do you see why you need to put these guys in their place and don't give them a platform? You know, God bless David Wood. He's very patient. He lets them run their mouth. Run their mouth, but I'm like Christian Prince. On my channel, I'm like Christian Prince. When you're on my channel, I don't let you run. I don't let you change the conversation. I don't let you <clears throat> tap dance to another passage. I like Christian Prince's style. You guys know, see how Christian Prince does it, right? He does not let the Muslims run or tap dance. He will not let them run. Now, bless his heart, David went my brother in Christ. He's got patience, right? He'll wait and let them rant and rant and rant. You can do that on David's channel. You're not doing it on my channel because I like CP's policy. No, answer this passage. Deal with this passage. Address this passage. Did I bring up chapter 3 verse 7 or you did? So anyway, there you go. That's why I love CP style, right? So anyway, with that said, some were asking me, why is that video with that young man put in private, right? Some were asking me, the, remember the discussion we had with that young man who left Islam? It's now, if you go to David Wood's channel, you can't find it. It's private. Well, because he was, he was, he was asked by the young man to remove it from his YouTube channel for now. To remove it because it caused him some problems. So keep praying for that young man. Pray the Lord Jesus will protect that young man. Pray the Lord Jesus will guide that young man. Pray the Lord Jesus will give that young man the boldness and the courage to seek Jesus, pursue Jesus with no harm. And if he has to suffer for the name of Christ, pray the Holy Spirit will empower that young man because he's only 19 years old. So keep praying for him. So that's why it was put on private. Yep, that's Islam for you. Even in the West. Even in the West, even in the West, Muslims do not have the freedom to pursue Jesus Christ because you got fanatical family members who will harm you nonetheless. They could care less about the West. This is why you got to destroy Islam. This is why we got to erase Muhammad from under the sun. And we have to erase Allah, this demon, and this filthy book, this satanic book called the Quran. 
We need to destroy it by the power of Jesus Christ until Jesus returns. Because you see what happens to those demonized zombies who believe this filthy book, this book of filth and porn, this book of Satan. They take the commands of this book seriously and harm those who want to leave it. So you need to pray that the Lord Jesus will empower us, get behind us, get behind Christian Prince, support him, Osama Dakdok, Al Fadi, David Wood, Jay Smith, myself. Stop complaining about our approaches. Not every one of us are going to approach Muslims the same way, but our approaches are being used by the Holy Spirit, different approaches to reach different people, and these approaches work. And for the record, if you don't know, Muslims actually respect you more and actually fear you when you are bold and in their face and willing to go give tit for tat. They do not like effeminate, sissified Christians because they think they're weak, they're spineless, they have no courage, and they must not believe the gospel because if they believe the gospel, they'd be passionate. So they see your lack of passion as cowardice. Okay, so pray for us, stand behind us, do your part to destroy Islam for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, I guess we'll do open Q&A. Travis, my brother, you know we're risking our lives. I'm not trying to be a hero. I'm not a hero. Apart from the Holy Spirit, I am a coward. Apart from the Holy Spirit, I am a dog, a maggot. My trust is in the Holy Spirit. I cling to the Holy Spirit. I beg the Holy Spirit. To make me holy and not shame Jesus and be willing to die for Jesus Christ. We are putting our lives on the line. We're risking it. You guys don't know. You may think we are really putting our lives on the line because people know what we look like, know what we sound like. It only takes one nut to do us in. But that's how much trust we have in the Holy Spirit. Our lives are in the hands of the Holy Spirit. No one can take our lives before the appointed time. So when people come in here and pontificate and people come in here and wax eloquent and people come in here telling us what to do, get the hell out of my channel. You go and show me a better way. You go do it. Put me in my place and you go do it better than me. If not, shut up. You don't like my channel? Go somewhere else. Right? No one told you to come here. But anyway, let's open up the Q&A. I definitely can't go to many Muslim countries. In fact, I'll take a risk going to the UK. You know that? It's even risky going to the UK. UK. Because you got a bunch of fanatics. In fact, it wasn't long ago you had 7-7 seven, seven in the UK. And it wasn't long ago where a group of Muslims murdered someone in the street. You remember that? The same thoughts I have of Muhammad. C.L. Edward, my view of him is my view of Muhammad. Muhammad was a dog of the devil. C.L. Edwards is no better. A dog returning to his filth. In fact, I'll use C.L. Edwards' own arguments against Muhammad to embarrass him. You know what's the beautiful thing about C.L. Edwards, guys? All you need to do is say, wait, C.L., I won't refute you. I'll let you refute yourself. You remember all those videos where you quoted Hadith to show that Muhammad was a white, racist pig, owner of black slaves? who owned black slaves and sold black slaves and oppressed black slaves. You remember those sessions? You did, CL? So I'm going to let CL bury you, Abu Yazid, and embarrass you and destroy your prophet. Glory to Jesus Christ. I'll use CL to bury Muhammad. That's why Abu Yazid, right, or Abu Kel, father of dog, doesn't debate us. He'll bark like a dog on Muslim challenge, but he won't debate us. Tell us, go ahead. Why don't you debate Sam now? You know Christianity, right? Put him in his place. Okay, now. I don't know. Should I talk about a topic? We got over 400 people. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Is uh, first last here? I don't think he's here. First last year? I don't know. Some of your questions, I really don't feel like entertaining them because... I just don't feel led in answering those questions. Let the Holy Spirit lead and guide me to answer whatever questions he wants me to answer for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let me see the first lesson here. Let me talk about atonement because it's my upcoming debate. Right. 
Let me just see something. I am live. All right. All right, folks. Uh, let me see. Really? Why you think? Don't think. Feel. It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. What's up, Dixon? How are you, buddy? All right. Any questions? I don't know. If we don't have people posting for me, I may have to read or I may just shut down. I don't know. No, Sonia Azam, I've seen her, meaning I've seen her face, but I haven't watched her stuff. As you're asking questions, I really don't understand that. I don't know what you're asking me, Sonia. As you are asking questions, I really don't understand that. What do you mean, Sonia? You confuse me. I have no idea what you're asking me. Rafat, what do you want me to tell you about the rapture? You want me to tell you that there's going to be a rapture before seven years? You want me to tell you that? Chill, let me know when I should block you now or later and get you a pack of now and laters. There is no rapture before seven years, my friend. I know people think there is. Ask them why they think it. I don't believe it. No rapture before seven years. No rapture at the midpoint. None. That's a recent innovation, a recent teaching. You won't find it clearly articulated in Scripture, nor will you find it in the early church. What you'll find in your church is a belief that Christ will reign for a thousand years on earth. Why are you asking me to destroy purgatory, uh, Barry Buckley? Why are you asking me to destroy a doctrine I do not know? So, again, it's not because I'm trying to tickle ears. Cop out. I used to think I knew enough about purgatory to oppose it. I don't. Let me just tell you something, a part of my journey. You know, Ezekiel chapter... Two has nothing to do with Israel becoming a nation 1948, guys. Calm down. Be patient with your questions. Let me take one at a time. Let me take one at a time, okay? I used to think years ago by hearing Protestants who would critique and refute Catholic doctrine that I actually grasped and understood why Catholics believed in purgatory and why they interpreted specific passages in support of purgatory. In my journey... I've been asking the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear this now. Listen to me carefully, and may the Lord Jesus keep bringing people, because I'll do a session. We'll talk. We'll talk about core doctrines. Holy Spirit, bring them. Stay over 400 for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. Okay. In my journey, in asking the Holy Spirit to set me free from traditions of men, show me my error, sanctify me to become more like Jesus, and to accept whatever is true from him, I've come to the point where I really do not know <clears throat> enough about these issues to discuss them with authority. In other words, I don't know much about purgatory. Historically, I don't know the ins and outs of what Catholics believe about purgatory to be able to adequately address it, let alone refute it. One thing I can say here is my policy, and I want you to learn this, because today earlier, Jay Dyer was debating apostate prophet. And Jay Dyer is a theological beast in refuting atheism and agnosticism. The Lord has blessed him with a sharp mind, one of the sharpest minds to refute atheism, agnosticism, a great blessing and a tool of the Lord Jesus Christ in showing why atheism, agnosticism is irrational and inconsistent. You can go watch that discussion. I have to say, without being disrespectful to apostate prophet, apostate prophet was out of his league. Jay Dyer is on another level philosophically, logically, for most atheists to handle. Glory to Jesus for that. May the Lord Jesus sanctify Jay, preserve Jay, and continue to use him to destroy atheism for the glory of Christ. I mentioned that because in his discussion with apostate prophet, he mentioned toll houses. Now, guys... Hear me out. I need you to listen now. Give me your ears. I need you to listen. Toll houses is unique to the Orthodox Church. The doctrine of purgatory, as defined by Catholicism, is unique to the Catholic Church. In other words, the Orthodox belief of toll houses is something unique to the Orthodox not found in Catholicism. The Catholic doctrine of purgatory is something unique to Catholicism not found in Orthodox. You know what that tells me? That tells me these are doctrines that developed independently when these churches were not in communion. 
Okay, listen to me attentively because this is very important teaching for you guys. And first last is here. Lord Jesus bless you, brother. I just finished 15 minutes barbecuing Mustafa, that young punk, that arrogant punk. So we send him packing. Hopefully God will convict him to repent and see Muhammad is a filthy son of the devil and he'll fall in love with Jesus. Now, when I find a particular church that holds to a particular doctrine, not found or embraced by the other churches, that tells me that doctrine developed independently when that church was in schism. You hearing what I'm saying? If you find a teaching that's unique to Catholicism, not found in the Orthodox, the Assyrian Church of the East or the Coptic, that teaching must have developed independently when those churches were not in communion. If you find a teaching in the Orthodox Church, not found in the Catholic Church, the Coptic Church, the Assyrian Church of the East, that means that's a doctrine that developed independently from the other churches because they were not in communion. When I find these unique doctrines that are not held in common by all the churches, that tells me those doctrines develop later. They are not ancient, at least in the present form that you find them. So they do not predate the 5th century. You, you understood my point now? Can you get this guy out of here? You understand my point? So what that means is these are not early doctrines that were held before the 5th century, before the 400s. Because if it were, we'd find all the churches embracing them because these would have been doctrines that would have been taught when the church was in union. And even after they split, they would continue to believe those doctrines as we find in the case of the Nicene Creed, the perpetual virginity of Mary, water baptismal regeneration, infant baptism, Eucharist, the priesthood. Yeah, please do hit the like button, guys. So that means you're left with one of two choices. You now need to see which of the church maintain doctrinal purity. In other words... Did the Catholic Church continue to follow the right path in its development of doctrine? And the other churches, though true churches and apostolic, <clears throat> ended up embracing doctrines that were not necessarily correct. They may be mistaken wrong without damning them. Then you become Catholic. Or did the Orthodox Church continue the path of developing doctrine in accord, in union with the Spirit, guiding it, even though the other churches didn't follow suit because they break off, then you become orthodox. You see my point? No, philosophical theist. I don't listen to Jeff Durbin. I'm not really impressed by him, so don't ask me that. You with me there? Because all of these churches, listen to me, all of these churches will recognize the other as apostolic in origin. Listen to what I'm saying, folks, please. I need you to learn this. The Catholic Church recognizes that the Assyrian Church of the East, the Coptic Church, and the Orthodox were started by apostles historically. The Orthodox Church recognized the Catholic Church is an apostolic church. Assyrian Church or Coptic, but they lost their way, Right? All of these churches agree that the others are apostolic in origin, but somehow in the course of time, they lost their ways and started adopting, embracing doctrines that are not true, that are false. They all think that of the other. Don't kid yourself. They all think that. You don't believe me? Go watch my comment section. Orthodox attacking the papacy, papal infallibility, purgatory, Catholics, they, they all go at it. Okay. So all these churches recognize that the other churches ended up embracing error, falsehood. Now, some will say that the error is such 
that they're cut off from the body of Christ and we cannot recognize them as true Christians. What I have seen, what I have seen, can I be very honest with you? And it doesn't mean I'm becoming Catholic. What I have seen, the most tolerant of the bunch that I have seen thus far are the Catholics. And I say this, whose ancestral church is the Assyrian Church of the East. My parents baptized me in the Church of the East. They were baptized in the Church of the East. Married in the Church of the East. Buried in the Church of the East. My ancestors, Church of the East. And I have to say, from my experience, and it's limited, very limited. So this is from my limited perspective. I have been to Assyrian Church of the East Bible studies, where the priest almost weekly attacks the Catholic Church, condemns the Catholic Church, and says the Catholic Church is envious of the Syrian Church and sent people in centuries past to slaughter Assyrians from the Syrian Church of the East. And I just, I've been, I, I heard that recently. And if Asulti is here, she'll confirm it. Okay. I have heard Orthodox condemn Catholics saying that it's a false church. The Pope is an antichrist, right? And not so many words, right? And the only true church is the Orthodox Church. And outside of Orthodox, there is no salvation, right? I've heard them say that. So among the groups, what I have found is that the Catholics have been the most tolerant. Ain't that, ain't that uh, amazing? The Catholics have been the most tolerant. Isn't that amazing? Now that's from my limited experience, guys. It's from this is from my limited experience. That doesn't mean this is true in every situation with every individual. From my limited observation, that's what I've seen. Well, Blake, that's the assumption, right? The assumption is that these doctrines are so false that they're damnable. Why would you assume that? Why assume it? Why not assume? that they hold enough true core doctrines in common that in spite of the mistakes, they are saved by the grace of God and the Lord will usher them into his glorious presence and that's when their theology will be perfected and complete. Because a prerequisite for salvation, if a prerequisite for salvation is sound theology, none of us are going to make it to heaven. None of us. None. None, nobody, nada, zilch. Shemu, uh, as Shemunian, you really well, look at the uh, look at the question he's asking me. Hey, was purgatory developed for exploitation? <laughs> Pins and needles. Needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. So don't take my hesitation to comment on purgatory as a cop out or cowardice because I want to be a crowd pleaser. May God save me from tickling ears. May the Lord Jesus purify my motives. The reason why I refrain from talking about that now, do you know why I refrain? Is because I have to admit I don't know enough to criticize it. No, C.L. Edwards. Uh, C.L. Edwards is a dog like your prophet Muhammad. In fact, Atamiak, are you upset that the Shia want to do muta with your mother and your sister and your wife? Because your prophet ordained treating women like whores, calling it muta, with the Shia say are not abrogated. So are you upset with that? You should be more upset that your prophet treated women like your mother like whores than C.L. Edwards becoming a, a Muslim, returning to his vomit like the filthy dog that he is, following his prophet. Right? Everyone with me there? I am not qualified to talk about indulgences. I am not qualified to talk about purgatory. It's historical and biblical basis. I used to think I knew enough about purgatory to refute it because of the passages that I felt were being misquoted. But I'm at a point, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to hear with an open heart why they believe it and why they think the Bible verses teach it and then wrestle with the answers within myself until I can come to a point and say, all right, you know what? I agree or I disagree. 
Because, again, I want you to realize, purgatory is also embraced by many Protestants. One of the most famous Protestants, considered perhaps the finest apologist of the 20th century, held a form of purgatory, not identical to the Catholic Church, but he held a form of purgatory, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis. And now you have Protestants following his example, affirming that the Bible teaches purgatory, a form of purgation. There is a Protestant philosopher. I always get his name wrong. Is his name Jerry Wall? Anyway, he's not Catholic, but he believes there is purgatory, and the Bible supports it. Right? So... Who am I to say they're wrong without hearing them out? Let me show you a verse, a verse for every one of you. Proverbs 18, 13. Proverbs 18, 13. See, I just told Christian Marok, ex-Muslim. He just said purgatory is invented to get money from people. Okay. Proverbs 18, verse 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. One more time. Proverbs 18, 13. Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and a shame to him. I'm going to repeat it twice, okay? Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and a shame to him. One more time. He who answers a matter before he hears it, is, it is folly and a shame to him. Many of you are answering a matter that you know nothing about. Many of you are condemning purgatory without even hearing what it is and why they believe it and what's the biblical basis for it. So you can examine their case and then come to an informed conclusion. So Proverbs 18, 13 says, you're a fool. I'm a fool for doing it. Let me read it again. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. Okay? Now Proverbs 18, 17. Proverbs 18, 17. Okay? Proverbs 18, 17. The first one. To plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. Proverbs 18, 17. The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and exam examines him. The first one who makes a case will sound convincing until someone comes and questions him. You understand what that means? You are a fool and you'll embarrass yourself when you go ahead and answer a matter before hearing it out. Number one. And anyone can sound impressive and convincing when they articulate a point until someone just as educated comes and then challenges him or her and raises objections to see how well that person deals with those objections. You get it now? You got it now? That's why I'm telling you, not because I'm trying to be a crowd pleaser. I'm trying to be pleasing to my God. I want to please my God. I want to honor my God, and I fail him to my shame. Jesus, have mercy on me, Lord, and forgive me. Crucify my flesh, which is why I won't answer anymore like I used to in my arrogance because I thought by hearing a Protestant critique of purgatory, that's it. I figured it out. I won't do that. I won't speak on matters that I'm ignorant about because I haven't studied why Catholics believe in purgatory with any great depth. I haven't spent the time to plunge deep into their reasoning, their arguments, and their biblical and historical basis to see whether it's solid or not. Nor have I done that for toll houses. Mustafa, do you want me to call you again? Hold on. Oh, my goodness. Khalilabu. Sargun, I wish I can headbutt you right in the mouth, Assyrian style. 
Because I was going to say if Mustafa wants to call and defend that. But it's okay. All right. Are you with me there? Okay. Nor am I well informed about toll houses. Because I have no idea about toll houses. Even Nada just said not every Eastern Orthodox believes it. But Jay Dyer said in his discussion with apostate prophet that the Orthodox Church has something called toll houses where it's a journey of the soul in the netherworld before they enter glory. Right? I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know why they believe it. I don't know their historical biblical basis for it. And Proverbs 18, 13 says to me, shut up. Because Proverbs 18, 13 says, a man who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. So you know what? God is telling me in his wisdom. God is telling me in his word. You know what the Bible is telling me? Shut up. Don't comment. Neither yea nor nay. Either yea nor nay until you hear it out thoroughly. Are you with me there? Is that making sense? Mustafa, I'm going to call you because I'm going to use Muhammad to bury you and himself and your God in hell because your prophet confirmed for Samuel 15. Are you ready, Mustafa, for me to call you to defend your prophet confirming for Samuel 15? Mustafa, are you ready? Because I'm going to call you. Is he there? I just want him to say, will he now... Tell me, yes, my prophet is a demonic bastard, a son of Satan, a spiritual whore, because he confirmed 1 Samuel 15. No, Apostate, I'm just loud by nature, and when I see your ugly face, it gets me louder. It's okay, Apostate Prophet. I still love you, but not too much. I don't care what David Wood says about you or what Jay Dyer did to you. I still love you, Apostate Prophet, but not too much. And I'm loud by nature. When I see your ugly face, I get louder. Okay? You're my brother in humanity. And not by choice. If I had a choice, he wouldn't be my brother. But you know what? I got to live with it. By the way, Apostate Prophet, I want to ask you a question, honestly. Apostate Prophet, I want to ask you an honest question. Are you there? When I was looking at you today, you looked like you're kind of pain. Was your face hurting you? Apostate Prophet, was your face hurting you? Because you look like you're in pain. Was your face hurting you today? No, honestly, I wanted to know. Because you look like, you know, you're, you know, was, were you, was it hurting you? No, because if it wasn't hurting you, it sure was killing me. <laughs> Get it? Your face wasn't hurting, but it's killing me. <laughs> All right, anyway. <laughs> I got mental issues. Good to see you, man. You know what? You know, and we pray. I know you don't believe in prayer and God, but it's okay. You don't believe in prayer in God, but God is real. And Jesus lives. And we pray Jesus, our Lord, opens your heart, brings you to him. Because I want to see you in heaven so that I can banter back and forth with you for, forever. Why only banter with you for 20 years? If you live forever, I can banter with you and take shots at you forever and ever in paradise. What's wrong with you, hater? Okay. With that said... Let me. Do you guys want me to talk about limited atonement in light of my upcoming debate? Lord Jesus willing, October 24th, I'll be debating Matt Slick. October 24th. Oh, by the way, I got some goodies for you this week. You guys ready? This Friday, God willing, I'm going to be scheduling it. This Friday, God willing. God willing, he's not going to call. He didn't tell me yes. God willing, this Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. William Albrecht. William Albrecht will be on to give us the early historical documentation from the 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century, showing that Christians unanimously held to the perpetual virginity of Mary. This Friday, Lord willing, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, William Albrecht will be on, God willing. He's going to quote the church fathers from the 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century, even up to the 5th century. I said the first 400 years. And you're going to see all the church fathers, 
that wrote on the subject, that spoke about the subject, that represented the true faith, defended the true faith, and even died as martyrs. To a T, they affirm the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mother of our Lord. This Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Monday, Monday, God willing, Monday, I'm bringing in A.K. Richardson at 6 p.m. Was it 6 p.m.? Anyway, check. It's already scheduled. I believe I said 6 p.m. Yes, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Next Monday, A.K. Richardson, does the Bible teach water baptism is necessary for salvation? He's going to make a case. Next Monday, God willing, Lord Jesus willing, he's going to make a case that the Bible teaches water baptism is necessary for salvation. Next Monday, 7 p.m. Um, no, no, 6 p.m., God willing, 6 p.m., Eastern Standard Time, New York Time, Michigan Time, next Monday, A.K. Richardson. And guess what, folks? He's not Catholic. He's not Orthodox. He's not a Syrian Church of the East. He's not Coptic. He's a Protestant. He's Church of Christ. A Protestant Church of Christ evangelist agrees with the Catholic, Orthodox, Coptic, Assyrian Church, and the early church fathers Water baptism is used by God to save you. So he's going to make a case that the Bible teaches water baptism, and it's not contrary to faith. It is definitional to faith. God willing, next Monday, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. William Albrecht on the church fathers affirming the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mother of our Lord. Quoting fathers of the 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century, up into the 5th century. Make sure you join me. And guess what? He's going to be sending me a document with all the quotations of the fathers that I'm going to publish on my blog so you can upload it, print it, and read the statements of the fathers for yourself. Now, Mustafa said call him, right? Okay, let's call him. I'm going to take another chance on this young man. If he talks over me and if he ignores me, I'm not going to waste my time, folks. Hold on. Hold on. Let me get there. Where is it? Oh, my, my sin. I don't want to be. Oh, my. Let's see if he's going to answer this time. If not, I'm going to hang the hang up on him again. Okay, Mustafa, you failed the first test and I had to muzzle you. Are you ready now? Oh, he hung up now. What happened? Okay, Mustafa, let's try it again. The first time you kept ranting and running like a coward at the muzzle you. Let's see if you're going to do better this time so I don't block you. Are you ready? Hello? No, he's not speaking. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, now again, you again ignore chapter 6, verse 108, because you don't believe in Muhammad. You believe like me in okay. your heart. He's a demonic bastard. That's okay. I agree with you. Go to Surat okay. al-Baqarah, chapter 2. If you ignore answering questions, I'm going to block you and muzzle you like Jesus muzzled Muhammad in hell. So let's see if you're a man and you're going to answer. Don't play kids games with me. I don't have time for you. So I'm taking another chance because the people want me to take a chance on you. Surat al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 246. Surat al-Baqarah, chapter 2. Verse 246, all the way to 2. Okay, first, I have to state my case first. No, we already heard it. You want me to block you? No. you got five seconds. Five, uh, uh, four, three, children, two, one. Bible. Okay, you see? Should I try it again? One more time? Should I try it again? Or should I just... Okay, waste the time, all right. How many, how many guys want me to try it again? Because he's not going to answer. You see that. 
We're wasting time with this kid. Okay. What well, do you guys want to try? Okay. I'm only doing it for you guys. Now, you guys are making me look bad. You know that, right? You guys are making me look bad. Why? Because when I treat these punks the way they deserve and I insult them and belittle them because they deserve it for mocking the Lord Jesus, blaspheming Jesus, and attacking the Bible, I'm the one who gets comments saying, I don't see Jesus in you, Sam. I don't see love or patience. Be patient, Sam. I don't see Jesus in you. So you're making me look bad. You know that, right? So, But I'm going to do it for your sake. As long as I keep getting 500 people to attend and support the ministry, I'll do it and let everyone else condemn me to hell, okay? Because I'm the one who gets insulted. Where's Jesus in you calling someone a spiritual whore? Well, I don't think Jesus in you, Sam. Repent, Sam. Okay, here, let me try it one more time. Surat al-Baqarah, chapter 2. You going to open it? Surat al-Baqarah, chapter 2. Put the sound down. Surat al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verses 246. Are you going to open it? Okay, I'm, I'm opening it. Okay, read Surat al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verses 246 to 252. I'm taking the third chance because of them. Thank them that they want me to waste time on you. All right, chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 246, all the way to 252. All right. Uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 246. All the way to 252. Slowly and loudly so they can hear you. I, um, you want me to read all this? No, I want my mother to read it from heaven. Hold on. Let me call. Hold on, Mustafa. Let me call her. Uh, mommy, do you have a Quran there? Can you read Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 246, 252, and I'll put you on loudspeaker? Read chapter 2, verse 246 to 252, dude. Okay. Um, have you not considered the assembly of the children of Israel after the time of Moses when they said to a prophet of theirs, send to us a king? Mustafa, slowly. Don't rush to this. I know you're scared. Slowly. Read scared. it again. Uh, or send to us a king, and we will fight in the way of Allah. He said, "Would you perhaps would you perhaps refrain from fighting if fighting was prescribed for you?" They said, "And why should we not fight in the cause of Allah? We have been driven out from our homes and from our children. But when fighting was prescribed for them, they turned away, except for a few of them. And Allah is knowing of the wrongdoers." And their prophets spoke to them, Indeed, Allah has sent to you Saul as a king. They said, How can he have king kingship over us while we are more worthy of kingship than him? And he has not been given any measure of wealth. He said, Indeed, Allah has chosen him over you and has increased him abundantly in knowledge and stature. And the law gives his sovereignty to whom he wills, and the law is all encompassing in favor and known. And their prophet said to them, Indeed, a sign of kingship is that the chests will come to you, and which is an assurance from your Lord, and a remnant of what the family of Moses and the family of Aaron had left carried by the angels. Indeed, and that is a sign if you are believers. Uh, Keep going. No does it say kill children and babies, so Keep going. That. It doesn't say it, they didn't. Stop adding to your Quran. Don't be better than your prophet. Keep going before I embarrass you. Keep I, going. I, that still five, four, three. Right now, don't be a demonic dog like your prophet. Keep reading. Okay. But you claimed uh, um, Jesus in your Bible. Keep reading because it's your filthy okay. Allah that ordered Saul to do that. So I spit on Allah, your fake, filthy God. Read. Read. All right. I, and when they went forth to face Goliath and his soldiers, they said, Our Lord, pour upon face us patience. Who? Who did they face? Only Goliath and like, his soldiers. Keep, keep reading. Yes. They said, our Lord, pour upon us patience and plant firmly our feet and give us victory over the disbelieving people. So they defeated them by permission of Allah and David and Goliath and Allah 
gave them kingship and prophethood and taught him from that which he will. And if it were not for Allah checking some people by means of others, the earth would have been corrupted. But Allah is full of bounty to the world. Okay, so did you read the section where it says Saul, which is Talut, and then Goliath, Jalut, and Dawood, and that they were commanded to engage in holy wars? Did you read that? Because I got another, sir. I just want to make sure you read that. You read that? Yes, I read that. Okay, now go to Surah al maida chapter 5. You read that, chapter 5. Surah al maida chapter 5, verse 20 to 26. Surah al the chapter 5, verse 20 to 26. Okay. Um. All right. Go ahead. Um, first, uh, and mention of oh, Muhammad, when Moses said to his people, Oh, my people, remember the favor of Allah upon you when he appointed among the prophets, when, when, when he appointed among you prophets and made you possessors and gave you that which he had not given anyone among the world. O oh my people, enter the holy land which Allah has assigned to you and do not turn back from fighting and cause of Allah and thus become losers. Keep reading all the way to 26. Keep on. Yep, go ahead. O oh Moses, within it is a people of umpirochemical um, 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 stream. And indeed, we will never enter it until they leave it. But if they leave it, then we will enter it. Said two men from those who feared to disobey upon whom Allah had bestowed favor. Enter upon them through the gate, for when you have entered it, you will be pre, um, pre, um, predominant. And upon Allah rely if you should be believers. They said, O oh Moses, indeed, we will enter, uh, um, we will not enter it ever, as long as they are within it. So go. You and your Lord and fight. Indeed, we are remaining right here. Moses said, my Lord, indeed, I do not possess except myself and my brother. So part us from the defiantly disobedient people. Allah said, then indeed, it is forbidden to them for 40 years in which they will wander throughout the land. So do not grieve over the defiantly disobedient people. I don't okay, now before you comment, I want everyone else to hear. Guys, did you see chapter 5, verse 20 to 26 of this filthy Quran is narrating that Allah, Allah, Muhammad's God, told Moses to tell the Israelites, enter the land of the giants, slaughter them, and they were too afraid, and Allah was upset with them. Then in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 246 to 251, Allah, Muhammad's God, ordered Saul to engage in holy wars by the command of a prophet, doesn't even know who the prophet is, and one of the wars included the wars with Goliath, and Allah was with Saul and David in their wars against enemies, including Goliath. Not a word from his filthy prophet saying what and they did was Jesus evil. Jesus in the Bible ordered killing babies Okay, so but wait, so you just admit so Jesus I'm, is Allah. You just admit Jesus is Allah. Guys, send them a flower. Because I just said the Quran Jesus showed the Allah sent Moses and Saul okay. and David, and, and he said to Jesus, al Masih Akbar, I spit on your prophet, that scum of the devil. Spit on Muhammad. Thank you for embarrassing Muhammad, that bastard. Thank you, Jesus, for exposing Muhammad, that bastard. Glory to Jesus. There you go. There you go. That's how you silence these dogs. You guys excited now? That's how you silence these dogs. You see this filthy, low-life scum, bastard of the devil? We read chapter 6, verse 108 of the Quran, which told this scum, don't insult their God because they're going to insult Allah. Did he respect his Quran? Did you go back and rewind? We began by having him read chapter 6, verse 108. I told him, look, your Quran says, don't disrespect Jesus or God of the Bible because then I'm going to mock Allah, humiliate Allah, and mock Muhammad, that filthy dog of the devil, if you insult Jesus, and your Quran says, don't do that because they're going to insult Allah. Did he even give a damn about the Quran? Did he even give a damn about chapter 2, verse 246 to 252? Did he even give a damn about chapter 5 of the Quran, verses 20, 26? All of which confirm that it was Allah who ordered Moses and Joshua and Saul and David to engage these wars, to kill their enemies. And not a word from his filthy Muhammad, that son of the devil, may the Lord Jesus wipe him out. 
annihilate Muhammad's name, Lord Jesus, for your glory. Not a word from Muhammad that what they did was evil and inhumane. You see, these demonic bastards don't care about their prophet. They don't care about the Quran. Because every time they attack the Bible, they're saying Muhammad is scum of the earth. We don't believe what he says about the Bible. You guys see that? All right. Let me give you the article on this. Everything that I said is right here in this article. Okay? Here you go. Save it. Here's an article that you can use. So you guys made me waste my time on addressing this little punk. This little punk, this tool of the devil, the scum of the devil, like his prophet, who comes on our comment section, blasphemes Jesus, attacks the Bible, mocks our Lord, right? And doesn't give a damn what his own filthy, satanic devil, Muhammad says. There you go, guys. All right. I hope you enjoy it so far. I hope you guys are okay because I'm letting you know now I won't get, I won't hear the end of it. I'm going to get these wishy-washy, effeminate, sissified Christians, these fake Christians who think they're humble and spiritual and honoring Jesus, condemning me for being nasty and rude and not being Christ-like. Okay? So this is what I have to undergo to give these Muslims a taste of their medicine, teach them to fear Jesus so that they don't think they can bully us and intimidate us and mock our Lord Jesus Christ. So glory to God, though, most of you are not like them. We got about 500 and you're enjoying it. And I want more of you who love Jesus and won't be wishy-washy, but bold as lions. If they insult Jesus, well, your prophet is a whore. Oh, you're attacking Jesus? Then Allah's Satan. Oh, yeah, well, your prophet was a woman raping whore who raped women, calling it muta, right? Rape women and also treat them like whores. That's what I want. Enough of this sissified Christianity. It's not working, guys. Your sissified Christianity is not working anymore. It's not. It's not working. James White, retire. Go do something else, my brother in Christ. Stop. You're embarrassing us. You think your approach is godly and winning Muslims. They use you as a useful idiot. They're laughing at you, dude. Yes, James White. Yes, you. Sorry about that. Okay. Now we got some sincere questions. All right, brother. Hopefully now we got some sincere questions. Evening, sir. Well, uh, uh, morning. Uh, it's evening here. Sorry about that. Well, it's, it's actually it's late night comments. for me too anyway. Anyway, go ahead. Your methods. Okay. I'm in absolute 100% support of you. Two and a half years ago, maybe I wouldn't have, but right now, absolutely, yes. You've got to be bold and aggressive with these guys because they will lie to your face and not feel a shred of remorse about it. Say it again. Two and a half years ago, you may have disagreed. So what made you change your mind? Oh, I got lied to by the Muslims. And I was mad about it. And I found out because I have a friend who left Islam. And one lie they told me, that they were Quran-only Muslims. That is a lie, 100%. They believe the Hadiths. They believe that Muhammad married a six-year-old and had sex with her when she was nine. They believed all of that. But they claimed that they were Quran only Muslims because they didn't want to have to answer that stuff to me. Okay. And they had no respect for you and took your kindness as uh, weakness and that you are a useful idiot, right? Absolutely. You know, I, I admire, I always used to admire like, you know, stoicism. I still do to a certain degree, but you cannot be that way with these people because they will lie to your face and not feel a shred of remorse about it. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, brother. Praise Jesus Christ. Welcome and it saddens board. me. To no end. But you know what? I agree with your methods 100%. And not only that, but so when my friend left Islam, we're all in college. So this was on a college campus. They told him that he should die, be put to death, because that is what the punishment for leaving Islam is. See? So anybody out there that thinks, oh, it's only Islamic extremists in the East, they're on your campuses too. There's a good possibility that quite a lot of them are jihadis waiting in the wings. 100%. They're called. So. Absolutely 100%. Heard. So, brother, ask me questions and I'll try to answer by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm glad at least we had someone who now sees you can't use this approach. And it's not an unbiblical approach. The approach we are using were used by the prophets and the apostles like Elijah. But with that said, brother, 
Well, I'll try to answer your questions, bro. What kind of questions you got? Let's see if I can answer. Them. Absolutely. Um, I had a question about baptism. Yes, sir. And is a baptism in just the name of Jesus valid? Yeah. Uh, you're asking me a difficult question because I have to know why are they baptizing, baptizing in the name of Jesus only? Who's doing it and why? So that's why I can't just come out and say yes or no. Who's doing the baptism in Jesus' name only and why? Okay, the reason why I ask is a common claim I hear is that um, at the end of Matthew where it says baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is that there are textual variances that say baptize in the name of Jesus. And There's the claim no is, is textual that variant. I have articles on this. Whoever told you that either was ignorant and misstated the case or they lied. There is no, let me repeat, he was told, and I have articles on this, I promise you guys. I have articles on this point, and I'm going to share it with you and by the grace of Jesus Christ in a minute. Okay, now, he was told there are textual variants in Matthew 28, 19. That's a lie from the pit of hell. There is not a single shred of manuscript evidence to show that Matthew 28, 19 does not exist in the form that you find it today. Every extent copy of Matthew 28, verse 19, in existence reads, baptize them in the name of the Father yeah. and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's number one. What they probably are talking about is the fact that in the book of Acts, you have the apostles going around saying, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's most likely what the person meant I don't know because I don't know who you're talking to. So maybe you can give me a little more details. Um, so I heard this from a fellow by the name of Michael Rood, and I'm sure you've heard of this name before. Yeah, that sounds and, familiar. I wonder why. Why is that name familiar? Um, why he's one of those Hebrew familiar? roots Christians, and he oh basically, yeah. yeah. You said right when you just said Hebrew roots. Okay, here. I'm going to give you here, guys, save these articles. I'm going to give it to him in the Skype comment section, but I'm posting it here for you guys. Here's an article on Acts 2 and baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ. I just sent it to you. I sent, I posted a link twice. There it is. Save it. And mods, please block all the Mohammedan dogs who are barking at their master, Jesus Christ. I don't have time for it. Now, brother, here is the link for you, okay? I'm going to give you another one, okay? Here's the link. Right there it goes. Did you catch it? I just posted it twice. You get it? Mm -hmm. Everyone else gets uh, that link. Thanks. Now let me give you another one. And so, no, if he told you there are variants in Matthew, he's lying. There's none. He's lying. He's making it up. And I'll hold him to a higher standard because he's passing himself off as an informed Christian. That's a lie from hell. So what you do is, you go back and say, uh, Michael Root. Here's the second article, guys. Second article, Michael Root. Please give me one manuscript copy of Matthew 20, 19 that reads differently from what we have in our Bibles. Every extent copy, here's the other article, brother, I sent it to you. Every extent copy of Matthew 20, 19, every copy that has Matthew 20, 19 reads uniformly, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son, Holy Spirit. So that's a lie from the pit of hell. And the reason why he wants you to baptize in the name of Jesus, because I assume he is a modalist, a modalist heretic, that Jesus is simply the human manifestation of the Father or that the Spirit of the Father indwelt the human Jesus so that Jesus isn't an eternal divine person distinct from the Father and the Spirit. He's a man indwelt by the Spirit of the Father, and the Spirit of the Father is simply the Father as a spirit. What does he believe? Uh, just to clarify, he's a Unitarian. So Yes. So as a Unitarian, he doesn't believe Jesus is God in any sense the human manifestation of the Father? He believes that uh, it, it's kind of complicated. He believes that the name of Yahweh was given to Jesus and he basically became God in yeah. some sort of sense. I'll try and find the articles for you. It's okay. So he became Yahweh. So a man was elevated to divine status and honor and glory. And this man's not an idolater. Pretty much. That's his viewpoint. I'll get you the links for that. Well, give me uh, specific believe. objections so I can refute them for you by the grace of Jesus Christ. So what else does he say? Give me whatever he's got. Let's deal with it. So we can throw it just because I already debated several Unitarian heretics of various flavors. I think one of them, his name was Andrew Griffith for Gospel Truth YouTube channel. And he also 
did a session with me on my YouTube channel, and I debated two leading modalist heretics, one of whom has since passed away, the late Pastor Stephen Ritchie. We had two debates that are online on Acts 17 Apologetics, and first and last, one of my mods, first and last, has those debates. We debated, does the Old Testament teach a trinity? Does the New Testament teach a trinity? And he didn't do too well. And then I debated the other oneness modalist heretic, Roger Perkins. He didn't do too well either. All glory to the triune God. Glory to Jesus Christ. So you can see I've dealt with them. Their arguments are pathetic. But give me some so I can I help do. you. Uh, the one that he uses, and this really shocked me. This is mostly for your mods or for everybody in the chat because I don't even understand why he'd say this. But So he goes to Psalm 110 mm -hmm. to prove why he believes that Jesus got elevated to the position of God. And he goes, so it says, the Lord says to my Lord, he reads through it. And then he goes down to the Lord is at your right hand. Mm -hmm. So Psalm 110 verse five. Yes. And that part where it says, Lord, is says Adonai. Adonai. Yes. I did a discussion and on it last night. Mm -hmm. Well, he says that originally this read Yahweh is at your right hand. Yeah. And that this was one of those instances where the name Adonai was placed in place. Yeah. Of Yahweh. What he's talking about. I didn't get to mention it yesterday. That's why the Jehovah Witness translation renders it Jehovah's at your right hand. He's talking about the 134 emendations that the rabbis supposedly made to the Hebrew text. The guys, let me explain what's going on here. Uh, Mike, again, Mike Root thinks he's intelligent. And that's what's scary is because people are going to hear him throw out these things and be intimidated, not knowing he's nothing but a pussycat. He's not... A, intelligent at all but he's a bible pervert let me explain what he's referring to there is a rabbinic tradition that says that the uh, safarim uh, safar scribe safarim the scribes replaced the name yahweh or jehovah with adonai 134 times there are 134 places in the hebrew bible where the name yahweh yahovah was changed to Adonai by Jewish scribes. One of those places is Psalm 110.5. Another one of those places is Genesis 19.18. Now, I don't know how in the world that supports this position because for Messiah to be Jehovah and worthy to sit in throne with Jehovah, he must be Jehovah ontologically by nature and not simply positionally, unless you want the Bible to contradict itself. So he's actually making my case, not his. But if that's his best, it's very pathetic. Well, and the other one he goes to is, um, ironically, John 20, 28, where Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, claiming that in this utterance, Thomas is claiming that he calls him Lord because he's still human, but he calls him God now because he got elevated to that position. No, that's not what the text says. That's his butchering of the text. The text doesn't say that Thomas is calling him my God because he was elevated to divine status. Because even before the resurrection, all throughout the Gospels, especially John, Jesus is going out of his way to show that he's God in the flesh, not merely human, which is why even his detra detractors realize he's claiming to be God in the flesh and yet took that as grounds of blasphemy and wanted to kill him. The disciples, on the other hand, knew He's making divine claims, but also knew he couldn't be a blasphemer, which is why they were perplexed and astounded. The disciples were seeing Jesus say things and do things that only God could do, but they knew he wasn't a blasphemer because he, they saw he's a man of integrity. He was righteous and good and holy, loving and compassionate, and even the Father bore witness on his behalf, but it didn't register how then could he be claiming to be God in the flesh when to them... A man claiming to be God would be blasphemy, but Jesus isn't blaspheming, yet he's making claims that only God can make. So he left them perplexed and confused until the resurrection. It's not that the disciples did not realize he was claiming to be God. It's they see he's claiming to be God, but they can't comprehend how that could be so because it would be blasphemy for a Jew to claim to be God, but he's no blasphemer, but he's claiming to be God. And yet that should be blasphemy, but coming from him, that can't be blasphemy, but he can't be God. So he's leaving them perplexed and confused and baffled until the resurrection, where now 
his resurrection vindicates his claims and the Holy Spirit being given to them grants them the illumination and the ability to comprehend the truth of those statements and now affirm them. No, he's not a blasphemer. And yes, he is more than a man. He's God in the flesh because now we come to accept that he is God in the flesh, distinct from the Father and the Spirit. But even before that, and I'm going to show you that, all throughout the Gospels, even his enemies are realizing he's claiming to be God in the flesh. For them, that's blasphemy, and they want to kill him on the spot. The disciples, on the other hand, are struggling with it. Wait, he just claimed something only God can claim, which would be blasphemy coming from someone else. But we know who he is. He's no blasphemer. How then can he claim to be God? They're confused and baffled and perplexed. Can I prove that to you? Absolutely, sir. Okay. You know, you keep calling me, sir. I told you, don't make me feel like I'm your granddad. Come on now. That's, How old are sorry, you, man? Uh, Mr. Shamoon. See, even Mr. Shamoon. How old are you? Uh, 21. Okay, well, I'm only old enough to be your father, so call me Sam, all right? Okay, Sam. Or call me Pops. All right. Now, let me affirm what I just said. Everyone else understood what I just said. Before his resurrection, Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh. The disciples could see he's claiming to be God in the flesh. And his enemies understood he's claiming to be God in the flesh. His enemy's reaction is blasphemy. Let's kill him. The disciples, on the other hand, no, he can't be a blasphemer. So we're not going to kill him or walk away from him. But there's no way he can be God in the flesh, leaving them baffled, perplexed, and confused. Let me prove that. You ready? Absolutely. Since he went to John, let's go to John. Go to John 10, 27 to 30. Everyone understood my point? Because someone said, I said Jesus. I don't know if Jocelyn was insulting me saying, I said Jesus. I hope she wasn't saying, I'm isogening the text. Because I'm going to have a field day with you, Jocelyn. Okay. John 10, 27 to 30. Slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. Here, read it for me. Okay, so this is King James. Sorry. All right. If the king ain't on it, the king ain't in it. Say again, again, Sam? If the king ain't on it, the king ain't in it. I agree, right. sir. Yeah. Sam. <laughs> yes, pa yes, son. Go ahead. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Deuteronomy. Yeah, that's all you stopped there? You didn't? You don't believe in reading oh, 27 30? Sorry. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now, before you move on, let's unpack what Jesus said. I've done sessions on this. I have articles on this, but it's good. We're creatures of repetition. We need to hear things over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of God's Spirit. Okay, now read John 10, 27 one more time. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Okay, so my sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me. My sheep, my voice, they hear. 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Okay, so here's the elements I want you guys to keep in mind. My sheep, my voice, they hear, they're in my hand. I want you to hear that. My sheep, my voice, in my hand. Go to Psalm 95. Psalm 95, read 6 to 8. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. My sheep... In my hand, hear my voice. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, the sheep of what? If you will hear the wait, wait, the sheep of what? The sheep, the sheep of what? The sheep of his hand. Whose hand? Uh, Yahweh's. So believers are the sheep of Yahweh's hand. The sheep in his hand under his care. And then it says to his sheep, read it. Today, if ye will hear his voice. Keep reading all the way. Harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now notice what he just read. The psalmist said, Israel are the sheep of Yahweh's hand and they are to hear his voice. Yahweh's sheep, 
in Yahweh's hand who are to hear his voice. But wait, didn't you just read Jesus saying in John 10, 27, 28, they're my sheep, they hear my voice, they're in my hand. Mm -hmm. And this is before the resurrection, right? Correct. And then the other thing you notice, Jesus said, I give them eternal life and no one can deliver out of my hand. I give them eternal life. No one can deliver them out of my hand. No one can deliver them out of my hand. I give them eternal life. You mentioned it, but go to Deuteronomy 32, 39. Deuteronomy 32 through 39. Yes. Deuteronomy 32 through 39. There we go. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Okay, now I'm really confused, everyone. Help me understand. Yahweh, Jehovah said, here's the proof that I alone am God. I not only kill, I make alive, and there's none who can deliver out of my hand. This shows you that I am the true God. I not only kill, but I make alive, and there's none who can deliver out of my hand. None who can deliver out of my hand. Jesus not only says he gives light, he gives everlasting light. He gives all believers never-ending, incorruptible life and moral incorruption, and no one can deliver out of his hand. Who does Jesus think he is? Now let me ask you yeah, a question. Okay. I want to ask you a question. What kind of attributes must Jesus possess to give every single believer never-ending, incorruptible, indestructible Moral and physical life. Well, he'd have to have the ability to give life, and he'd have to know who to give the life to. What kind of attributes so, would they be? So what would we call these? Theological terms. Um, omnipotence and omniscience. So how can the mere human Jesus, before the resurrection, claim the very prerogatives, functions of the only true God of the Hebrew Bible and apply it to himself? He'd have to possess some form of divinity. So why does this heretic, son of the devil, say he wasn't divine until after the resurrection? It really puzzles me, too, because I was listening to one of his lectures, mo mostly for humor, and it, it didn't really make much sense to me either. So I'm only bringing this up mostly so everybody else here can be familiar yeah. with these. And helping them to refute it so you're being a blessing to them. But now, in that same context, he said, my father who is greater than all, right? No one can deliver him out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Now, in the context of John 10, what kind of oneness is Jesus envisioning? When he says, I and my father are one, in that context that he says, none can deliver out of my hand. I give them never-ending, incorruptible, moral, and physical life, and none can deliver out of my father's hand. What does he mean that he and the father are one? One in what sense? They're not one person, so they're one in what sense? Uh, divinity how do we know that he's saying i and the father are one in divinity how do we know that's the meaning well the previous verse where it's or the previous backup of 29 where it says my father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand and he connects himself with that in the previous verse where he says and i give them unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Mm, you got it. As in they have one in the same hand. So that means Jesus' power is equal to the Father's power, so they are one in power, they possess the same power, and therefore they're one in essence. Exactly. You see? If you guys don't understand the context and how to show from the context, he's claiming to be one with the Father in power, in ability, therefore one in essence, then you're not going to make your case. You're not going to be able to prove that he's claiming to be one, not just in agreement with God, united with God in God's purpose. He's one with God in their power. No one can pluck out of Jesus' hand because he's all powerful. There is no power that can rival Jesus to destroy the sheep from his power, his hand of protection. Neither can they do it with the Father's hand. Hand here means power. My power is equal to my Father's power. Our power is equivalent. We are one in our ability and power to preserve incorruptible. It's one in essence. Now, further points to show you that Jesus, before the resurrection, is claiming to be God in the flesh. Now, notice how the Jews reacted. John 10, 31 to 33. How did they understand 
Jesus before the resurrection. Guys, I hope you're paying attention. If not, then it defeats the purpose of me answering his questions. John 10, 31 to 33. How did the Jews understand all of that? John 10, 31 to 33. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man, makest thyself God. So hold on, brother. I'm confused. I thought Jesus only became God after the resurrection. Here before the resurrection on earth, his enemies realize he's claiming to be God in the flesh, a man who is God, which they took as blasphemy. And Jesus doesn't correct them. He reinforces the fact he is God in the flesh because he goes on to quote a psalm saying, even evil, wicked, immoral rulers are called gods whom God will destroy. And then you come and whine and complain that I claim to be the divine son, one with the father, when the works I do show and vindicate I am exactly who I claim to be. If these wicked rulers can be called gods when they're immoral and God will destroy, how dare you accuse me of claiming to be the son of God who's one with the father and therefore God in the flesh when I have my father's backing. The miracles I do is the father working in union with me to provide miraculous confirmation and backing for all the claims I make. He's amening my claims. And how do you know he's amending them? The miracles that I do, I do in union with him because he's backing up every assertion I make. So Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh before the resurrection. You see that? Yes. Okay, now I'm going to give you, correct. I, I want to give you a couple more to destroy this Bible perverts destruction of scripture to a shame and humiliation. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. That's Second Samuel. First Samuel chapter two, verse two. Yeah. Uh, no, that's Ruth. My bad. Uh, As he's getting there, everyone understand my points, or am I confusing anyone? Help me yeah. to help you. Let me know if you're getting it, because this is food for your soul to know Jesus truly, love Him more passionately, and be able to then affirm who He is according to with the scriptures okay now first samuel chapter 2 verse 2 mm -hmm. there is none holy as the lord for there is no one beside thee neither is there any rock like your god so is anyone like jehovah nope is anyone comparable to jehovah absolutely not okay now read verse 6 some of the things that jehovah does which no one else can do it the way jehovah does it verse 6 first samuel 2 verse 6 the Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He okay, no, I'm sorry. You went to six. You went, don't go to seven. Oh, Say sorry. six. My bad. So who brings down to the grave? Yahweh. Who brings up from the grave? Also Yahweh. Okay, now go to John chapter 6, verse 38 to 40. John chapter 6, verse 38 to 40. Six now, guys, you got to really pay attention to what I'm about to do right now. You guys really got to focus or you're not going to get the point. John 6, 38 to 40. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should rise, raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Okay, guys, Jesus said, I came down from heaven, which is heretic Mike Rude, and I hope he debates me so I can send him packing and muzzle him for the glory of Jesus. He doesn't believe Jesus existed in heaven, right? That would be correct. But Jesus said, I came down from heaven to do the will of him who sent me, meaning he was there in heaven before he appeared on the earth, and he appeared on the earth from heaven to do God's will. That's point number one. The second point, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me, every single believer, I will lose none of them, but raise them at the last day. Challenge Mike Rude and these other sons of the devil, these heretics. Quote a single passage in the Old Testament where someone other than the true God will resurrect the dead 
on the last day. No one besides God raises the dead at the last day. But Jesus says, I will raise them immortal, incorruptible at the last day. Did you guys catch it? Two facts that Jesus affirmed. I came down from heaven, which means he was in heaven before he appeared on earth. And I will raise all believers at the last day, resurrecting them, making them immortal. Now, let's see how the Jews understood Jesus and Jesus' response. John 6, same chapter, 41 to 44. Same chapter, John 6, 41 to 44. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not, how is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Read that one more time. What did they say? One more time. Is this not who? Is, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? So notice they understood that Jesus is speaking Literally, that he literally personally came down from heaven and they're baffled. Wait, but we know he's just a Jew. We know his parents. We know Joseph, his father. How in the world can he say that he literally personally came down from heaven? But in making that assertion, they show he, they didn't really know him because Joseph wasn't his biological father. In their ignorance, they thought they knew his parentage, that Joseph is his father. But in saying that, they show they didn't know him. They were mistaken. Joseph wasn't his father biologically. Jesus did come down personally from heaven, and they're baffled. How can this Jew say he was in heaven before he showed up on the earth? Now, does Jesus correct them? Let's keep reading now, all the way to 44. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not amongst yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So notice again, I myself will raise them up at the last day. Now, the heretic may say, yeah, yeah, on the day of resurrection in the future, Jesus will be elevated to God's status, and he has that power. That's what he's going to say. Now, let me show you this power that Jesus possesses to raise the dead at the last day, immortal and indestructible, is a power he already possessed while he was on earth before his death, according to John. Let me now repeat. I'm going to show you this power that he will exercise in the future when he will resurrect believers immortal is a power he already possessed on earth before he dies, which means he must have already been God on earth before he died. Let me prove that now. Now, let me just give you one more passage, and I'm going to prove it. Go to John 5, 25. John 5. I hope you guys are being blessed and learning and... And growing more in love with Jesus and the Word of God. I hope you are. I don't know if you're listening. John 5, 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Notice it says, the hour is coming and is already come. Now, already come. Now, where the dead will hear the voice of who? The Son of God and live. By the power of my voice, I will give spiritual life to those who hear me now. But then what about at the future? Now go to John 5, 28 to 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear the, his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So now, brother, in light of John 5, 25 and 28, John 5, 28, 5, 25, 28, where it says, the dead shall hear the voice of, son of the Son of God. And then 28 says, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Whose voice are they hearing? Whose voice will those in the grave hear? The, the Son of God, the Son of Man. Okay, so this means he's going to physically resurrect the dead, at that hour, both the righteous and the wicked, right? Absolutely. Now, he's going to say, well, that's future. Well, and I believe that in the future, Jesus will have godlike powers. I'm going to now show you this power that Jesus claims to have to physically resurrect both the righteous and the wicked at the hour, the last day, is a power he already had while he was on earth because he was already God while he was on earth. Are you guys waiting for the evidence? 
The power that he will display in the future is a power he already had at that moment on earth because he was already God in the flesh. He didn't have to wait to become God. I'm going to prove it to you. Go to John 11, 23 to 26. Lazarus. John 11. You got it, Solo. John 11, 23 to 26. Watch here. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection. No, wait. Did he say, I will be? No, he did, said he is the resurrection. Did he say, I will become the resurrection? Or I am right now, speaking to you, right now I am the resurrection and the life. He said that he is right now the resurrection and the life. Keep finishing it. Now go ahead and finish it. <laughs> the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Okay, now notice he said, I am right now the resurrection of life. And remember earlier what he said? The dead who hear my voice will live. How does he resurrect Lazarus? Go to John 11, 39 to 44. John 11, 39 to 44. Before Jesus his said. death, before his resurrection, before his death, at that moment on earth, notice what he does. John 11, 39 to 44. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that said was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, loose him and let him go. Did you guys catch it? Jesus had said in John 5, the hour will come, and it is now, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and they will live. Now, he's talking about spiritual life there. But then he says, the hour will come in the which all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out, meaning physically raised. And what did he do? He resurrected a dead man physically out of the grave who had been dead four days resurrected him physically out of the grave by his voice. Notice a loud voice, the voice of the Son of God, proving that right there at that moment, he is the resurrection of life. He possesses divine life because he was already God in the flesh and didn't have to wait to become God after the resurrection. Did everyone get it? Did you get it? I know you got it, brother, but everyone get it? Mm -hmm. Now, Absolutely. let me give you one more to show you. Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh before his resurrection. So this man is a Bible pervert, and I'll be more than happy to school him and send him packing for the glory of Jehovah Jesus. But go now. Do me a favor. Go to John 16. We're going to break it down in two sections. Read John 16, 25 to 28. John 16, 25 to 28. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I came out from God and did what? Read it. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Now, let me ask you a question, guys. Read 27, 28. I came forth from the Father and entered the world, and I will leave the world and go to the Father. So here's my question. These are the questions I asked the heretics. They could not answer. Go watch the debates. I'm not lying. They could not answer for the life of them because we have the truth, because by the grace of the Holy Spirit, he's revealed the truth to us, which is irrefutable. 
Don't take my word for it. Go watch the debates. I use these very arguments. Now, question. When Jesus said, I leave the world and go to the Father, did he leave as an actual person? Did he leave as an actual person and go to the Father as an actual distinct person? Absolutely, 100%. So you get it. Did everyone else get it? Jesus, I'm going to the Father. Did he go to the Father as an actual living conscious person? Yes. Absolutely. But wait, what about the first half? Notice it's parallel. I came out from the Father into the world. I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. Well, if the leaving of the world and going to the Father is an actual personal going, where he goes as an actual person, then on what basis do you say the coming down from the Father into the world isn't actual and personal? If he went to the Father as an actual person, that means he came down from the Father into the world as an actual person. You can't get away from it. There's no way around it exegetically, contextually. You see it? Mm -hmm. uh, but now it gets better because now John 16, 29, read what he say right after he says that. John 16, 29. His disciples said unto him, Lo, thou speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb okay guys you catch it you're now speaking plainly not figuratively right not metaphorically so if someone tells you well it's not literal jesus said i'm speaking plainly and the disciples said oh you're speaking plainly you're not using figures you're speaking literally plainly and we get it talk about a burial of unitarianism does everyone get it is everyone getting it now, Maybe. because Jesus spoke plainly, now that Jesus is speaking plainly and not figuratively, now they understand that he's speaking literally. Notice the conclusion they come to now that Jesus is speaking plainly. Now, notice what they say. Continue all the way to 31, where you left off all the way to 31. John 16, mm -hmm. 29, 31. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest pl thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, do ye now believe? Okay, now I'm confused. They said, now that you're speaking plainly and literally, not figuratively, we now finally get it. You know all things. You don't need anyone to question you to see if you know what you're talking about. We now believe you know all things, and that convinces us you did come from God. And Jesus said, what are you talking about? I didn't actually come from God into the world. Speaking figuratively, and how dare you say, I know everything. He goes, you finally get it? You finally realize I know all things and I came from God? It took you this long to get it? So now let me ask you a question, brother. How can Jesus know all things before the resurrection, before his death, if he's just a man and not God in the flesh? Airtight reasoning. I can't come up with anything. And how can Jesus have personally come down from the Father into the world. If this heretic is right, Jesus is just a man and did not exist in heaven before he became man. The whole, I can't really answer the whole going forth from Father, but I can say the common thing they like to say is that, well, the coming down from heaven was figurative, but you yourself said that he's speaking plainly here and the disciples believe he's speaking plainly. So, And why do you take idea. the first part figuratively and the second part Literally, when it's it's part of the same structure, sentence, conversation. The part where he says, I'm going, I'm leaving the world, going to the Father, follows immediately that part which says, I came from the Father and to the world. On what basis are you going to now slice and dice his words? Oh, well, this part is figurative and this part is actual. Well, the thing is, is, you can't do that because the disciples plainly said that he's speaking literally. So the Thank whole you. sentence has to be literally. So you see ample proof. Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh and did miracles to prove that he's God in the flesh before his death. And Jesus plainly taught he already existed in heaven before he entered the world to become man. The Jews understood he claimed to be God. And those Jews who understood didn't believe wanted to kill him because they took it as blasphemy. Whereas the disciples who didn't think he's blaspheming, were left perplexed because they can see he's claiming to be God, but that would be blasphemy because he's just a Jew. But we know he's no blasphemer. What's going on? They're blown away. 
Can I give you one final example? Absolutely. Go to Mark 4, 35 to 41. Mark 4, 35 to 41. Mark 4, 35 to 31. And guys, after this, I have another caller with questions. I hope you're still being blessed and you learned a lot on various topics for the glory of Jesus. Mark 4, 35 to 41. Okay. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and saith unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Okay, why were they afraid? Read 41 again. Why were they afraid? Read it again. And they... Mm -hmm. Read it one more time. What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You see why they are frightened and freaked out? They saw a Jewish man tame the wind and the sea by his word, by his powerful word. The wind and the waves obeyed him and instantly went completely calm, blowing their minds because they're looking at a Jewish man sleeping, doing what the Old Testament ascribes to God controlling the natural elements in a manner that the Old Testament says God alone does, and they're freaking out. Who is this man? Did you see what he just did? He just silenced the winds and the waves, and at his voice, they obeyed and recognized his voice and immediately went still. Who is he? What's going on here? They're blown away, right? Because they saw the miracle, but they knew the miracle is something attributed to God alone in the Old Testament. But they're looking at a flesh and blood Jew who's sleeping on top of that, like a man. What is going on here? Who is this man? How is he able to command the winds and the waves and they obey him? Right? Now let me show you the Old Testament parallel. Job 9, verse 8. Job 9, verse 8. which alone spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. Okay, now, what it means treadeth means that he tramples on the waves of the sea and controls them. They're under his authority. Who alone has power to trample the waves of the sea, according to what you just read? Well, according to the passage, it'd be Yahweh, God. So how could Jesus do what the Old Testament ascribes to Jehovah? He was Jehovah. That's why they're freaking out, because in their mind, that doesn't register. No, he's a Jew, a flesh and blood Jew. He's a man. He's sleeping on top of that. Our God is not a man, and he doesn't sleep. He's a man who's a Jew, and he sleeps. What is going on here? Go to Psalm 65, 5 to 8. Psalm 65, verses 5 to 8. Psalm 65, 5 to 8. By terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are afar off upon the sea, which by his strength setteth fast the mountains, being girded with power, which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. Wait, wait, wait. Whose power stills the noise of the seas and the noise of the waves and silence riots? God, Yahovah. So how did Jesus do that? Keep reading Tate. Finish it. Keep reading Tate. They also that dwell in the uppermost part are afraid at thy tokens. They, they, when they outward. see his signs and wonders, what is their reaction? Thou makest the outgoings of the morning. Oh, sorry. When they see tokens, me tokens means when they see his signs and wonders over the people and they're roaring and over the seas and the waves and the mountains. What are their reaction? How do they react? They According to the psalmist, they rejoice. No, you're not reading it, bro. You're hurting them. I'm about oh, to cry. Sorry. 
Didn't you just read verse 8? <laughs> they also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid at thy tokens. They're scared. And what was the reaction of the disciples when they saw this Jewish man silenced by the power of his voice, the winds and the wave, and immediately they listened and submitted? Oh, they were scared. So why are they reacting to the miracles of Jesus, tokens of Jesus, the way the psalmist says people react at the signs and the tokens and the sovereign authority of Jehovah over creation? Because he's God. <laughs> so where does this heretic get that Jesus only became God after the resurrection when all before his death, He's doing things that only God can do, saying things that only God can say, and they're getting it. His Jewish disciples are getting it, but they're confused how it can be true because they're looking at a Jewish man sleeping, doing things that only God can do, speaking as only God can speak, which would be blasphemy, but he can't be a blasphemer, so they're perplexed, whereas the Jews who hate him, they realize it. You're claiming in God. It can't be true. You're a blasphemer. So they're all getting it. Well, the only thing I can conclude, because he's kind of pigeonholed himself into believing in Unitarianism, is that he forces himself to believe this and will try to interpret away any other passages sure. before that. And it's... It. To his humiliation, to his failure, to his destruction. You can't refute truth, because the Lord will embarrass you and silence you and expose you. So I hope that answered his point. Did you have any more <laughs> points from him, or did I cover... No, I mean, I was just going to say... I'm not listening to this guy because I find him particularly no, intelligible. I, I usually do it as a brain teaser, you know? Yeah. I, like me, I, I listen to heretics so all the time. I get it. No, no, but it's good you brought it up because now you blessed others to understand. Mm -hmm. Because, like, I'm not as literate at scripture as you, far from it. But, my brother, you, you know how old you are? Of, how old are you? 21. You will be. You, God has blessed you. You have a commanding voice, you have a hunger for Jesus, a love for his word. And by the time you reach my age, you'll put me to shame. I'm 48, dude. Don't compare yourself to me. Everything I am is because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Everything good is the work of the grace of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that indwells me indwells you. And he'll do wonders through you. You are on a good path. When you're 48, if the Lord tarries, you're going to put me to shame. And that's how it should be because it's not about me. It's about the glory of Jesus. May he increase. May we decrease. And may he destroy my pride. And envy in Jesus name so I appreciate your sentiment Sam one one last class go ahead. question no, go ahead, man, I'm here no, no rush uh, get to the other Skype caller I noticed you grimaced when I mentioned the word Hebrew roots is there anything yeah. in particular about that that yeah concerns you? let me tell you why uh, and even your name when you when I for, when you first called me and I saw your name is in Hebrew because for a long time I bought into, <clears throat> not into the Hebrew roots per se, I didn't follow it, but I came under the influence that somehow knowing Hebrew, uttering Hebrew, speaking Hebrew, and following Jewish customs made me more special and closer to God, which was an insult and blasphemy to his word. Because, oh, okay. you know, you, you get it now, right? You see why? Okay, so the, like the whole sacred name thing, which I think is ridiculous. Not only sacred so name. The fact that you have people wanting to speak Hebrew, right, and use Hebrew names for God and Jesus, and also dress as Jews, and this, what this does is it elevates one language and one people over other peoples and make, makes people feel inferior. In other words, why does a Mexican need to adopt a Jewish name? Jewish garb and speak Hebrew words when that person's Mexican because they bought into the lie that somehow Israel still the chosen people and that Hebrew is a sacred language and if I can speak like them and act like them I'll be more special and God will love me more which is an insult and blasphemy because Galatians 3 28 says there's neither Jew nor Greek neither free nor slave neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. So to want to be Hebrew and dress as a Jew and sound Hebrew when you're Mexican or Indian or Assyrian, you're insulting Jesus and blaspheming his word where he says, I don't discriminate anymore. 
The Jew is no more special than you. His language is no more special than yours. You're all one in me, which is why the New Testament is written in Greek, not Hebrew. Okay, that's all I was asking because I, I was I just cringe. concerned if – I was just wondering if it was – just the mere observance of no listen like the biblical festivals that... no because you know as a gentile who worships and loves jesus christ you are free to keep those holy days but when you do it in such a way where you leave the impression that you got to do it if you want to be special to god and you got to do it in hebrew and then you'll be closer to god that's an insult to the lord jesus and the new testament which is written in greek and not in hebrew that's why in cringe I'll give you an example. Someone in the comment section before my live, live stream yesterday, I had to block him because he adopted a Hebrew name. And he says, oh, that is like the Lechem Panim. And he kept espousing Hebrew terms. And I said, dude, do you think you're intelligent? Or you think you're impressing me because you're throwing Hebrew terms? Do you think uh, by throwing Hebrew. Hebrew terms, you're going to show that you're knowledgeable somehow because you know Hebrew? You know, people like that discuss me because it shows spiritual arrogance and pride. Why can't you simply say the bread of his face? See? Lechem panim means lechem bread of his face, the bread of his presence. Why would you be that stupidly arrogant to write it in Hebrew knowing that most people here won't understand unless you're trying to impress people? See, I know Hebrew. And you know what you do? You show me you're an arrogant tool of the devil, and I need to muzzle you. And I got rid of him for that reason. Okay. I mean, that's, that's all I was curious about because, you know, I too celebrate the Jewish, you know, holidays and stuff. Well, no, that's I'm okay. Not, no You're free. Jewish. You're free to do that. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't become legalistic and think that makes you special. Right. Absolutely not. No. Okay. What's your ethnicity? Oh, uh, Tamil Indian. Okay. I'm biracial. So God made you Tamil Indian, not a Jew. That means he wanted a Tamil Indian to worship Jesus and love Jesus as a Tamil Indian. Because if he wanted you to speak Jewish and <clears throat> have a Jewish name, he'd make you a Jew. Keep that in mind. Okay. <laughs> I see what you're getting at. Because oftentimes when I see people attack the Hebrew Roots movement, they say, like, if you keep those customs, you'll be under a curse. And they'll quote Galatians. And no, it, it, you'll only be a curse when you insist that it's law keeping along with Jesus that saves you. That is a false gospel. But if a Gentile, oh, yeah, no, I'm in good. If a Gentile wants to follow the holy days, that's fine, as long as you don't make others do so. In other words, if you look to a Gentile and say, "Hey, how come you're not keeping Kashrut? Hey, how come you're not keeping Yom Kippurim? Oh, then you're not really following Jesus. Then you're going above what is written, and you're perverting the gospel, and you need to repent. Okay, I mean, I will fully admit, and I. A little ashamed to admit this. For a long time, I did have a phobia towards Sunday, but you kind of slowly eased that out of me. So, you know, I don't longer you know have why, that brother? legalistic view. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because you're 21 and you're zealous for Jesus and you want to love Jesus and honor him. So you're going to go through phases. I went through the same phases. I went through a phase, no Christmas tree. Because Jeremiah 10, verse 1 of 5, condemns the Christmas tree. I went through the phase. We shouldn't celebrate December 25th or even Easter. They're pagan. We all go through these phases because in our zeal to want to become pleasing to Jesus and love Jesus and faithful to his word, we're going to run into movements and ideologies that we will buy into thinking this makes us more spiritual and holier. And then finally, years go by and say, what a stupid idiot I was. You know, someone yeah, I, put a meme. I just want to share this meme with you. A meme said, if your older self met the younger you, this is on Facebook, what would you say to the younger you? I would say to my younger me, you, it's, if you had three words, if the meme said, if you had only three words to say to the younger you, this older you meets the younger you, like a teenager, what would you say? Three words. I would say, you, you stupid moron. Those three words. You stupid moron. That's what I would say to the younger me. Yeah, and I I admit there was a small point where I had that phase too about the Christmas tree, but I've... Woo, you got I've more phases, baby. There ain't nothing <laughs> yet, honey. Watch what's going to happen to you when you get 48. You're going to say, damn, I was dumb. But you know what? Hopefully, you'll make your mistakes, 
faster than I did and come out of them faster than I did. So when you're 48, you'll be sharper than me. I don't know if you'll ever be better looking. Sharper, yes. Better looking, I don't think so. Just ask Jocelyn. There's no one better looking than me. Just kidding. I'll go ahead. <laughs> I will say you pull off the bald look better than any person on the planet. I will tell you that much. That's why you are not far from the kingdom, baby, because you have eyes to see. Arr, arr, arr. No, I'm just kidding. Brother, if you have the more questions, end, ask me. If you have any more questions? Oh, uh, no, I'll let you get back to your session and get to the other caller. Good questions, brother. Feel free to call me anytime. I'm here to serve you for the sake of Jesus. Absolutely. Uh, have a good rest of your day. God bless you, brother. Sam. Thank you. And then you didn't even tell me your name again, yeah, see, because it's in Hebrew. Thank you. And thank you for hanging up on me. I appreciate it. See, that's them young punks for you. They hang up when they want because they own the world. Little punk. No, just kidding. No, I'm just kidding, man. He felt jealous. Oops, sir. Hey, Mel, what's up? So long, Mel. So long, man. How you doing? I'm all right, man. So long, man. You know, I never turn you, Frank. But go ahead. <laughs> uh, let me just uh, shut off the YouTube sound. I don't hear anything. By the way, he calls himself Mel Gibson. You know he ain't Mel Gibson. You know that. And whenever yeah. I see the word Mel, one of my favorite movies, by way of confession, I need to repent. One of my favorite movies is Scarface, right? So long, Mel. Have a good trip. Yeah, no doubt, eh? Yeah, yeah it's a pretty lot of good quotes in that movie. Too Everybody many. quotes it. Too many. I'll never turn you, Frank. I may want to quote on the side, but I'm loyal to you, Frank. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Everybody loves those quotes, man. You're a good man. So uh, I'm always, I'm always debating this Jehovah's Witness, and then um, it occurred to me that but maybe mean. last time, last time I debated him was, uh, it turns out they don't even, they don't believe even John the Baptist goes to heaven, which you probably know. So um, they don't believe John the Baptist goes to heaven. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. You, you heard about that before? No, but I've heard of Hebrews 11 says they're liars, but that's okay. But go ahead. So. Um, uh, I didn't get him I'm on the spot because it occurred to me later. I'm like, hold on. If John the Baptist doesn't go to heaven. Oh, yeah. I, now I understand why. Because you're talking about Joe's Witnesses. Because my mind went to the Hebrew roots, you see? Because this guy was oh, talking about yeah. yeah, let me explain what they believe. for the the. And Oh, by the way, Emmanuel Perez, a former Jehovah Witness, and Ken Naridi, two former Jehovah Witnesses, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. They're listening. They can confirm this. The reason why they don't believe John the Baptist and the rest of the Old Testament go to heaven is because only 144,000, the anointed class of born-again spirit creatures, will reign with Jesus in heaven, and that's not the Old Testament saints. All the Old Testament saints will be resurrected to live on earth in a paradise on earth. Only 144,000 after Jesus, right, chosen by Jehovah, will be born again, and to them, born again means they'll be made spirit creatures living with Jesus, another spirit creature, and ruling with Jesus over the earth in heaven. And by the way, Emmanuel Perez and Ken Narita will confirm this. Did you know that the Jehovah's Witnesses say the Bible is not for us? It's written for the 144,000, and only they are born again? Only they are born again? Emmanuel Perez, am I wrong? Only the 144,000 are born again, no one else. I, I didn't know that about yeah. them. That's what well, they believe. Crazy. But um, I kind of I kind of trapped him with, um, what was it? I trapped him with uh, Luke 13, 20, where he says, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they'll, they'll all be in the kingdom of heaven. But one thing I one thing I didn't trap him with, it didn't, it didn't cross my mind at that point. Maybe you can help me, Sam, is um, right. remember when Jesus said um, to the thief on the cross, you will be with me in heaven? What I should have said was. We'll be with me in okay, paradise. In paradise. In paradise. Yeah, correct. No, but you I can't I use that. Them, I should ask them. Maybe you can help. Like uh, you can't use that. Arguments. That you so can't you know use that verse. That, that, that the thief that the thief will go with Jesus. But you can't use that verse, well. Mel. So long, Mel. No, you can't use that verse. You know why? Why is that? Because if you read their translation, and guys, what he's referring to, if you read Luke twenty-three, verse forty-three, Luke twenty-three, verse forty-three. Do you have your Bible with you, by the way, or you're going to just make me read for you? It's faster, but I can pull it up on the internet. Okay, well, you're going to have to. What version do you read? Uh, uh, anything. I just go on Bible Hub. I know, but what's that you when you read the Bible for a daily devotion, what do you read? Man? I have the Good News Bible and the New American Revised Standard. Don't ever use the, new, the Good News Bible. So you have the New American Standard? I do, yeah. It's in, okay, you're confusing me. <laughs> Dude, no, we're not going to be able to finish this before midnight if you don't tell me what version do you read. Well, let's not any version. I don't like. I don't have an issue. Like okay, when you when you get up in the morning and you want to read a chapter of the Bible, what Bible do you read? 
I, I honestly like the Good News Bible, man. It's really easy. I, I actually love that Why Bible. Why you The sinner, Good News Bible dude. is really good. Sinner! All right. Anyway. <laughs> it's a really nice translation. Okay. If you, if you have Bible Gateway, whatever Bible you're using, I want you to go to either New American Standard Bible or New King James Version. It's first last year or he left? I guess he left. Either version. New American Standard Bible or New King James Version. Just read it for me. Well, I thought you were here. Okay, first last. Post either one, and I want you to read because I'm going to show you how their translation renders it. That's not a verse you go to. It's Luke 23, 43. Luke 23, 43. Okay, I'm going to read it for you, New American Standard Bible. And he said to me, truly I say to you, comma, today you shall be with me in paradise, right? Correct, yeah. Truly I say to you, comma, today you shall be with me in paradise, not in the Jehovah Witness Bible. The Jehovah Witness Bible has, truly I say to you, today, comma, you shall be with me in paradise. Can you post the Jehovah Witness Bible? Guys, even this passage they have perverted. In the Jehovah Witness Bible, New World Translation, and he said to him, truly I tell you, today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. So in their translation, Jesus is not saying you'll be with me in paradise today. He's saying, I'm telling you today that you will end up with me in paradise, leaving it for the future. But the, isn't he guaranteeing him that he's going to be one of the 144,000? That they, depends on paradise where it is. Because paradise to them would be on earth, but then they have a dilemma because Jesus will be there. So I'm just figuring, wondering if they believe that this is heaven or the paradise on earth. Because when the rich, man, the, when the thief died, he ceased to exist, and he'd only be recreated in the future, at, you know, after <clears throat> Armageddon, and then paradise there would have to mean paradise on earth. But Jesus won't be in paradise on earth, so that creates another contradiction. Mm. Because to okay. them, the earth is going to be paradise. After Armageddon, right, Jesus reigns for a thousand years, and then there's going to be a new heaven, new earth, and new heaven and earth will be when the earth becomes a paradise. That's the paradise, the one on earth, the paradise. So that thief will be living in that paradise because when he died, he ceased to exist. So... Uh... Do you recommend I can use this, or are they not even sure that, that he's no, going to go why would you use in paradises? That's not proving because that any, they're in heaven. It's showing that they'll be in a future paradise, and they'll tell you it's on earth. The only thing you can use it to show is the contradiction. Well, it says Jesus will be with him in that paradise. But according to you, Jesus is in heaven as a spirit creature and won't be dwelling on earth with us. Yeah. Oh, okay. And... Um, so remember when, um, you, you know the context more than me. Remember when Jesus was drinking in the Last Supper and he says, I won't do this again until we, we drink in the kingdom of heaven? Sure, that's the disciples. I, They're part of 144,000. Can I can I make an argument for the, the actual body in heaven? No. Because he said he's, that. because you know what I'm going to say? No, because it's, even angels eat food and they don't have physical bodies. But he's going to do that in the kingdom of heaven in that verse. Exactly. And he's going to do it as a spirit creature with other spirit creatures because spirit creatures can eat and drink. That's what they believe. As they are, they believe? Okay, as tell, they are, hey, they no, let me tell me what you want to hear so I can repeat it back to you because I guess you want me to affirm your weak argument. So go ahead. Tell me what you want to hear. Go ahead, Mel. Come on, Mel. Well, I'm just I'm just confirming if they believe that as they are, as a spirit, no, they can hear, who they, told you, they have to ch transform. Yes, because in the kingdom, they're not going to be physical bodies. They're going to be spirit creatures. So in that kingdom, when their condition is changed as spirit creatures, as spirit creatures, they can eat and drink because angels in the Bible eat and drink. Okay. Oh, no worries. You get my point? But Mel, I know you're trying hard, and I'm sorry to shut down your arguments, but I got to sharpen you, right? Iron sharpens iron. I uh, so yeah. these now that doesn't mean every Joe witness you speak to has this level of understanding to respond to you. But what they're going to do is they're going to find someone to respond. Say, yeah, in the kingdom, when they're transformed, their condition and stay transformed spirit creatures, they'll be eating and drinking because angels eat and drink, but they don't have physical bodies. Right. So long, Mel. Right. <laughs> so my question is, why are you wasting time? Here's some advice. Why are you wasting yeah. time on the afterlife and the resurrection when what you need to focus on is what's essential? 
the triune nature of God, <clears throat> Jesus, the God man, and that he still exists as a glorified human being with a glorified physical body. Talking about death and resurrection after life, that's important, but not as important as getting the Godhead right. I do like I, I gave him all your arguments. He ignores them, and then okay, sometimes so then, he just brother comes up with brother. excuses. Can I share something? Because you're my brother, right? Yeah, bro. Matthew seven six. Do not give what is sacred to gods or cast pearl before swine, and wipe the dust off your sandals. Why you keep pushing this conversation? Because Jesus says that if someone has shown a persistence of rebelling or opposing or contradicting, have nothing to do with that person. Move on. That's what I do on my YouTube channel. When someone comes and barks like a rabid dog and blasting Jesus, I block. I don't waste time because I take those passages okay. seriously. Um, now, since you brought that up, uh, a passage occurred to me. I want now, from your understanding, how far should we take this passage where he says, after the first, or after the second or third admonition, I have nothing to do with them. How, like, you take it that... at face value. If you've admonished someone who professes to be the household of faith, but he's opposing the, the doctrine, and then embracing heretical doctrine you warn them and after the second third warning they refuse to repent have nothing to do with them but that's also in the context of an elder who is paul saying that to you and by the way he's referring to titus 3 verses 10 to 11 titus 3 verses 10 to 11 that's what he's referring to who is he saying this to to an elder in other words when it's reached the level of the elders of the church the bishops that's the highest authority on earth if you don't listen to the bishops after repeated exhortations, then you must be excommunicated, thrown out of the church until you repent and restored. If not, you are to be cut off. But this is not speaking of the lay person. It's talking about the apostles and the elders that are appointed because he's writing to Titus. And one of the things that he sent Titus to do was to appoint elders. Let me prove that to you. Titus 1 verse 5. First, last, can you point? Uh, can you quote it for me? Titus 1, verse 1. Excellent questions, guys. We're learning a lot about various subjects. Talking to Titus, for this cause, I le uh, left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So he's not talking about a layperson. He's talking about Titus who is an authorized agent of Paul to appoint elders. He's talking about the highest level of authority in the church. When a bishop exhorts you, repent, brother, sister, stop, and he does it more than once and you don't listen, you are to be thrown out of the church, excommunicated, and not allowed in fellowship with the church until you repent. And this is confirmed by what our Lord says in Matthew 18. Matthew 18, we're going to read verses 15 to 17. Now, do me a favor, first last. Quote it in the New King James or New American Standard Bible so the English is a little more smooth. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. <clears throat> Who's trying to call me now? I don't get it. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if you will not hear, take with you one or two, two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to, he to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. See, once you get it to the church, meaning the leaders of the church, that's the highest authority. You don't get any higher on earth. If you refuse to listen to them, you're thrown out. That's what Titus 3 Verses 10 to 11 is saying. Mm. Okay. So um, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was also, I heard by a priest that when it comes to, when it, what is it called? Um, speaking in tongues that maybe, I don't know if you, if you know, but I heard there's various opinions. There when is. somebody speaks in tongues, are they speaking their own native language, but it comes out in a different language? Well, I mean, I don't, I've never experienced speaking in tongues, but those who spoke in tongues say they say a language they don't understand. And that's confirmed in 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul says he prays with his spirit, but he doesn't understand with his mind. So that means it's a language that even the person uttering it may not know what he's saying. And that's why Paul says, seek its interpretation, right? 
I didn't even, I didn't even catch Paul saying that. Yeah, read okay. the entire chapter, First yeah. Corinthians 14. He says, I'd rather pray with my mind than with my spirit. Well, why that distinction? Because praying in the spirit and not with your mind means you're praying in such a way your mind doesn't understand. I'm, I'm just writing it down. I'll, I'll read it later. Just read the entire Corinthians. chapter, yes. So from the people I've asked, I've never experienced it, but Paul confirms they may speak a language they don't understand, and some do because they've given the gift of interpretation. Now, some don't believe those gifts are valid. That's another discussion for another time. I'm not. And by the way, this again shows the amazing inclusivity of the Catholic Church. Are you aware there are charismatic Catholics, Catholic charismatics? There are actually Catholics who believe in the charismatic gifts like speaking in tongues. Isn't that shocking? Uh, no. Yeah, shocking, right? I didn't, I didn't know about that. I've met them. No, I've met them. In yeah. fact, yeah, well, the, one of the people who was a leader in the movement, his name is Father Richard Simon, and he's on Catholic radio, right? And he's yeah. got a show called Father Knows Best. I met him face to face. He was part of the Catholic charismatic movement, a movement of Catholics who also spoke in tongues and would meet with evangelicals and worship in the spirit. When I first heard about it, I thought it was satanic yeah. to the core. May God forgive me, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Holy Spirit, pity me in Jesus' name. Oh, boy, I made a lot of mistakes in my time, and God in his patience tolerated me. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Right? Thank you, Lord. But anyway, that's just to let you know, it's not just Protestants. There are Catholics who believe it. Uh, okay. Um, well, one last question, Sam. You probably yes, want to go, go to sleep or something. Go ahead. Um, I was listening to... Uh, Dr. St. Genis, and I asked him a question about um, uh, praying praying for the dead. Yes. And uh, he, he said, sorry, I don't, I don't remember the pastor. You probably know it. There, there's, a, there's a part where Paul talks about somebody who may have passed away. Yes. And he says, may the Lord have mercy on him on that day. Yes. And Dr. St. Genis took that passage and he said, he basically made a case for Paul praying for the dead. Do you know about that passage and do you believe yes. he was praying for the dead? Well, uh, that's, that's a debatable passage. But the point is... It can be taken that way, and if so, I have no problem with it, right? Oh, okay. You get what I'm saying? So you're asking the wrong person because I don't have a problem if it's true because you do find early in Christian history, right? Okay, uh, early in Christian history, yeah. the practice of Christians, and this is found in, let's say, statements of Tertullian. It's also found in inscriptions right, catacombs and so forth, where they were praying for the dead. Now, let me give you the verse that he's referring to. 2 Timothy 1, 16 to 18. Are you ready? 2 Timothy 1, yeah. 16 to 18. Are you ready for me to read it? This is the passage that Genesis is referring to. 2 Timothy yeah, 1, 16 to 18. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me, often see past tense, refreshed me, was not ashamed of my chains, but when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. So this, because it's past tense, many believe it's because he's already dead. Second yeah. Timothy 1, 16, 18. To be honest, I have no problem if it is. Let's say, okay, just for argument's sake, follow with me. Let's say Paul did pray for a dead saint. A believer who honored the Lord Jesus and honored his servants and died, and he prayed for him. Okay, what's the problem? If your theology comes from the Bible, and this is what the Bible teaches, why do you have a problem with it? You no, know, you're correct. Yeah, I, I personally have a problem with it. I was trying to defend it. You get my point? My point is, when I was a staunch Protestant and did not want to believe these doctrines because it wasn't fashionable to believe them as a Protestant, I would do everything to refute it. Glory to Jesus, I'm not there anymore. I don't care. If it's true, I'll accept it. Okay? All right. That means I can pray for someone, yeah. that God will bless him and honor him and increase his pleasure. How does that work? I don't know because I'm not in heaven. If the Bible teaches, accept it. But the other point is, the other point is, you find early, the early church doing this. You can't escape this. You find it in inscriptions. As early as the second century, they're praying for the dead and asking the saints in heaven to pray for them. And then this becomes a widespread belief and no one's condemning it. No one is condemning it. Did you hear about the inscription on uh, St. Peter's tomb? It says, Peter, pray for us. Thank I you. I watched it on uh, 
YouTube. Thank you. And you know what, yeah. brother? Because I'm convinced on the authority of Scripture, those who've died in Christ are, are alive and glorified and perfected and by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes known to them our request for them to pray for us. I will say in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus Christ, the God of Peter and the apostles, Peter, pray for us. Paul, pray for us. You are my hero. Blessed Mother of my Lord, pray for us. Here's where I stand, biblically yeah, and historically. Amazing. I'm actually very excited for your debate with uh, Matt Slick. I'm like not. I was, I was, I'm not. You're not? No, you're you not know excited. what? You know I'm not? Well, I'm, I'm not. really scared about this debate. Not because of his arguments, because he can get loud and he can be rude and he can be, uh, he can shout you down and be disrespectful. And I know myself, I'm loud yeah. and rude and disrespectful. And I'm afraid that we're going to snap at each other and yell at each other, disrespect really? each other, and then no one benefits. So I'm scared. So I'm praying, God, please, if he attacks, give me the grace to shut up and just let him. Because you see, honestly, you see me. When someone attacks me, yeah. I get animated and my flesh kicks in and may God save me from sinning. That even when I rebuke someone who deserves it, I do it for the glory of Christ, not in sin. But he's a brother. He may not consider me a brother after he realizes where my path has taken me. I still consider him a brother, but I have to say, this is just being honest. You're asking me. Yeah. Yeah. Every apologist that I know has serious mental issues. I am the first. David has serious mental issues, right? Yeah. Al Fadi, uh, Usam, we all do. Christian Prince, we all are a bunch of nuts, misfits that God is using for his glory. And I have to say, the two people, that are the most arrogant, proud, and can be very condescending and rude. And this is coming from someone who can be rude and condescending, right? Yeah. James White and Matt Slick. <laughs> well, the thing is, uh, do you notice how like some debates are exciting to watch, like crazy fights, like Mike Tyson and the Big Shot? So that's why I was really excited, you know, because like there's some some apologetic debates I don't care about. I yes. don't watch them, but like. The big shots, like I was excited to watch you and James White. Like that, that was going to be like a heavyweight fight, you know? Well, let me be upfront and as honest to God as possible. And I pray I don't come off as being arrogant. Lord Jesus, have mercy yeah. on me. My pride yeah. and my hope is in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I trust he will fully possess me for the glory of Christ. Matt Slick's yeah. arguments for limited atonement, they're pathetic. They're pathetically oh, really? bad. They're pathetically uh -huh. bad. So as far as refuting him, that's not difficult. That's very easy. It's not refuting him. It's how he's going to react. And how is he going to treat me when I yeah. put holes in his arguments? I'm being honest. You guys may think I'm being arrogant. I'm being honest. He's probably one of the worst defenders of limited atonement. His arguments are pathetically bad. James is a little better, but James White's arguments are bad as well. The, the one person I would say, I'm being honest. Remember, I used to be a five-point Calvinist. I've heard their arguments, and I used to teach them. And they'll say, well, you never understood uh, Calvinism, which is why he left. Okay, that's fine. That's what Muslims say when a Muslim leaves that, Islam. He says that to everybody. Yeah. So that's okay. But I will tell you who would be massively impressive and very intelligent. And he has a very sweet demeanor and spirit. Anthony Rogers. He's a beast. He's someone to reckon with when it comes to limited atonement. And another brother that I have a lot of respect for, Edward Dalcor. But they're both gracious and humble and quite knowledgeable, both of them. So they, they are formidable in defending their position. But I, James I thought White, Anthony was Coptic, but maybe you're no, joking. No, Anthony Rogers? No, he's a five-point Calvinist. Uh, yeah, I think you were joking that day because you said Anthony's going to be Coptic, I'm going to be Catholic. I thought maybe you are just joking. Oh, okay, yeah, day. yeah. But as far as Matt's, I'm being very honest, guys, and you make him off arrogant. Please forgive me if that's it. I'm being honest. Oh, Jeff Derman? No, he's he's not good. I'm not impressive. Uh, he, yeah, is, yeah, he, yeah. he is the least impressive, Jeff Durbin, when it comes to Calvinism, Leonard Tolman, and the Trinity. All he does is parrot to James White. And I'm not oh. impressed. I am not impressed. I'm actually turned off when someone parrots the arguments of someone else instead of taking that information and making that information his own and then communicating it through his own manner because we are not carbon copies of one another. I can learn from you, take your arguments, but then make them my own and present them my own way because I'm not you, you're not me. And I'll be honest, listen to Jeff Derman. You think you're listening to James White. When it comes to limited Tom and Trinity, Sounds like James White, just the parrot of James White. I'm not impressed, and he's not that impressive. He's not. I'm being oh. honest. Matt Slick, James White, Jeff Derman, the least impressive when it comes to limited atonement. 
They don't impress me. And Matt's arguments are bad. And I'm just being honest, very bad. And James White, a little better, but he's bad too. I'm being honest, guys. You don't want me to be politically correct. I'm being honest to the Lord. And so they should know their own lane and stay in their own field. But with that said, brother, do you have any other questions? Um, I, I have a question, but I don't know what position you take on this question. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Catholic, so but there's this really? verse that Matt always uses, and I don't see anybody, or sorry, Matt Slick uses, I don't see anybody ever able to refute him. But um, he always uses the verse where he says, um, I don't know if it's Paul, he says, um, Colossians 2.14. Cancelled yeah. out at the cross. Colossians 2.14. I'm going to decimate him on that. I already have the material. You want me to address it here? Uh, Col is, yeah, Colossians 2.14. Yeah. Ironically, you say that because I'm preparing the material to post it on my blog so I can give it to oh, the really? folks to read it. Yeah, his argument, that's why I'm saying it's one of the most pathetic arguments. His arguments are bad. And I'm, I'm afraid when I do glory to Jesus, all glory to the Holy Spirit, decimate his argument, he's going to react and probably get nasty and rude. And then insult me that I don't understand logic. I don't know Greek because he does that. Right? Am yes, I lying? Yeah, he does. Oh, man. He does. Yeah, all the time. He does that, right? So I'm anticipating oh. that. Guys, you want me to put holes in that argument for you? Do you want me to refute his <laughs> argument now? It's before so, it's do, so pathetically you... bad. Uh, it's pathetically bad, my brother. It's pathetically before bad. Before you do, Sam, yes? I, I, watched his, I watched his debate with that Church of Christ guy. He, he, told, he told him, he's like, I use this verse every time, every time. I, I destroy everybody every time. Okay, you want me to refute every that line? I love this verse. Okay, you want me to refute that line? Please, yo, please. I have yo. a friend of mine. He's right here. I think he's listening. He was here. This Assyrian guy. Uh, he was listening. This Assyrian guy, if you're there, put a one. If not, he comes and he joins me on my channel. This Assyrian yeah. guy, about a year ago, okay. went on Matt Slick's program and used my argument. I go, use this argument, Colossians 2.14. When he did, Matt Slick flipped, attacked him, called oh, really? him a heretic, and said he's preaching universalism. And he was being gracious, and he had to calm Matt Slick down. This Assyrian guy will oh, tell you. Yeah. <laughs> so Sorry, he says, can, I, can I tell you one story? Can yes. I tell you one story before uh, yes. before you continue? Yes. But except, I swear to you, you, you told him, you told the other Assyrian guy to use your argument. Guess what? Guess what? I went on his show. I used your argument about uh, communion of the saints with, with, uh, with the rich man and Lazarus. I told him he's interceding. Guess what? I used your argument. I even told him, like, this is Sam, Sam Shimon's oh, yeah, argument. Mentioned that to me. And he Thank said, you. he said, he said, uh, don't ask me about that. He's like, ask me about Revelations 5 where, where the, the prayers are in smoke. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's and like, he got upset at me. This. He kicked me off the show. Yeah, he got he upset at me. Uh, you were the guy, right? Because he got upset me because of you. <laughs> <laughs> that was me, bro. I told him, like, this is Sam's yeah. argument. He didn't no. even address it. Tim, maybe English is not your first language. Using my arguments in your own manner, in your own way, and making it your own is not parroting. I know, Tim, it's hard for you to comprehend because I probably attacked your idol and you're now hurt and sensitive and you want to cry me a river. Go listen to Jeff Durbin. Listen to when he speaks of limit atonement and Trinity and listen to James White. It's You think it's a recording of James White. And I'm pretty certain this young man, when he presented the argument, he didn't sound like me and didn't speak like me. He presented it his own way, but he said he got it from me. Do you understand the difference, Tim Etherington? Because you're being a smart aleck. And you know what I do to smart Alex, right? I become Matt Slick, the Assyrian version. But anyway, let me now, you want me to put, again, guys, let me yeah. be clear again. You can love a brother and still criticize him because Matt Slick and James White do it all the time. You don't believe me? Go listen to Dividing Line. In the last several years, James White's Dividing Line, you know he's going to criticize a Christian. Can you tell me when's the last time James White did a dividing line where he doesn't criticize someone? Now, there are folks worth criticizing, right? Black Lives Matter, they're socialist, fascist, right? Anti-God. Well, you understand. But can you show me a dividing line within the last two years where he doesn't quote some Christian on some viewpoint that he disagrees with and then refutes, and sometimes in a very condescending manner? So if they can criticize Christians and still be considered Christ-like in doing so, then don't condemn me when I say their arguments are bad and pathetic and they're still brothers in Christ, which I do recognize they're brothers in Christ because then you're being inconsistent, you're a hypocrite, and you're a man worshiper. I just want to be clear. So I consider Matt Slick a brother, James White a brother, though I may get upset with James White and some of the things he says and his harsh criticisms of me and David Wood. That's okay. God will deal with him. 
But don't take it as personal when I'm being honest. When I tell you an argument is bad, it's because I'm being honest. I'm not going to tickle your ears. Matt Slick's argument is pathetically bad for atonement. Now, let me prove it. Are you ready? Yeah, go ahead, bro. Go ahead. Okay, let's go through with it. Are you guys okay that I go through his argument and dismantle it? Are you guys ready? He's ready. Well, this I'm young man's ready. I want to make sure everyone's ready. Okay, Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Do me a favor for us last. Post Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Here's his argument, and I will sum it up. And this is what I'm afraid he's going to snap at me. Colossians 2, 14, 15. Notice his argument. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Now let's look at 14 one more time. Colossians 2, 14. One more time. Pay attention now so I can put a hole through this argument. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now here's Matt Slick's argument. The written requirements, the chairo grafa, whatever it means, it's irrelevant to the point. He even admits it can mean the law or the written charges, meaning our sins. Jesus nailed the written charges of our sins on the cross. Jesus nailed it, took it away, and you did nothing to contribute to it. Matt Slick's argument in a nutshell is Jesus removed the written charges by nailing it to the cross, and it had nothing to do with you and your faith. He did it, and he did it alone, and he removed it entirely by himself. So what's his point? If Jesus removed the written charges against everyone, then that means no one is condemned. Everyone goes to heaven because it says he did it by himself, nailing it to the cross. It's not something you did by believing in him. You understand his point? So he's trying to put you in a dilemma. Either now you believe everyone will be saved or you must argue that he only nailed the written charges for the elect because the elect will come to faith but the elect's faith is not what resulted in the written charges being nailed to the cross. Jesus did it all by himself, nailing it to the cross, and he only did it for the elect, because if he did it for everyone, then everyone would have to be saved. But we, don't, we know only the elect will be saved, so he must have removed it only for the elect, and it had nothing to do with their faith. Do you understand his argument? Yeah, nobody's able to refute him yet, so even I, I don't know where to look. <laughs> Oh, that's so easy. You want you'll laugh how easy it is to refute. Okay, everyone, everyone got his argument. Since Jesus removed the written charges by himself, and it had nothing to do with your faith and belief, he did it. So if he did it for everyone, everyone must be saved because there's no written charges against anyone. Or this proves only the elect, because only the elect will believe and be saved. So he only removed the charges for the elect. And he thinks, see, that's it. Are you ready for me to put holes through it? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'm now going to show you what happens when we employ Matt Slick's eisegesis to Colossians 1. And then I'll go back to Colossians 2 and show you its contextual meaning. And I want you to use it against him today. If you find him today, go on Discord and use it, and he's going to block you. I promise you. Okay, let's go to Colossians 1. Let's go to Colossians 1, 16 to 17. Now, let me show you how Matthew's eisegesis proves too much. It does prove universalism, that even Satan will be saved, according to his logic and misinterpretation of the passage. Colossians 1, 16, 17. Guys, pay attention. For by him, all things, pay attention to the language. All things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things consist. So brother and everyone, Ask them the question. When it says all things in heaven and earth were created by Jesus, through Jesus, for Jesus, he exists before all things, and in him all things consist. Isn't that proof it's referring to the entire creation? All things in heaven and earth means Jesus created everything, nothing exempted? 100% correct, yeah. You're right? Okay, now here's the 100%. dilemma. Are you ready? Yeah. Colossians 1.20. Colossians 1.20. 
Watch here. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And game over, Matt Slick. Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross for all things in heaven and earth, for every creature. He did it by himself. It has nothing to do with your faith. So Matt Slick ends up proving universalism. Did you catch it or no, brother? Does, does that mean like even the evil spirits? Is that what you're trapping? Well, hold on, buddy. If all things in heaven were created by him, that includes evil spirits, then all things in heaven were reconciled by the blood of his cross. You can't escape it, can you? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you see how pathetically bad his argument is? And I'm sorry, he's my brother, but in his arrogance, he thinks it's irrefutable. Reconcile all things. <laughs> You caught it? Oh, man. <laughs> so is that what you're going to tell him? Like, uh, No, I'm going to be <laughs> gracious to him when I say it. But I'm afraid he's going to egg me on and attack me. And then I, and I, Because you know what? If we both start shouting, we're going to dishonor the Lord and no one's going to be edified. Yeah, you guys are going to put on boxing gloves if you guys start you know, shouting. So that's why <laughs> I have to constrain myself and shut up, honestly. Okay, so yeah. do you see... <laughs> If I follow the way he butchered Colossians 2.14, and it is a butchering. Jesus reconciled all things on earth and in heaven and made peace by the blood of his cross. All things on earth and heaven correspond to 116, all things in heaven and earth that he created. So no one will say that when Paul earlier refers to Jesus creating all things in heaven and earth, that doesn't mean every creature. No, it means every creature in heaven on earth. Well, then the parallel is he then reconciled all things that he created in heaven and earth. All things that he created in heaven and earth, he reconciled, making peace by the blood of his cross. Therefore, you end up with universalism, Matt, if I follow the way you're butchering Colossians 2.14. <laughs> oh, man, finally, finally. I, like I was reading Bible Hub, man. I couldn't get the answer. but <laughs> Okay, but now I'm going to explain to you what Colossians 2.14 means in context because you didn't read it well and – People let him get away with murder. But the Assyrian guy, this Assyrian guy, used this very argument, and he started shouting at him. And he told him, Matt, calm down. Don't be disrespectful. I'm a brother. And he got blocked. He got thrown out. When was that? Like a couple weeks here, ago? Here, here. Well, hold on. Let me see if I can call him because he was in the chat. I'm going to get him on the phone, all right? Hold on. So you know I'm not lying. Oh, uh, Matt, if it's recorded, I want to listen to it. I him. hope it is. But it's going to be recorded, uh, God willing, next week. Hold on. And then I'm going to give you the answer from Colossians 2.14 if he picks awesome. up. Awesome. We're having a good night tonight. A lot of good answers, a lot of challenges. He's not picking up, unfortunately. I don't know why. He was on. Uh, it's he's probably on sleep. Sleep. Yeah. It's okay. Sleep, I know. Yeah, yeah, it's late for him. Okay, if he doesn't pick up, that's fine. Now, let me show you an answer, Colossians 2.14. Let me show you an answer, Colossians 2.14. Are you ready? Yeah. I'm going to explain it. Colossians 1 and 2 in context. I'm going to explain what it means and what it doesn't mean. Okay, Colossians 2.14, one more time. Here's where you let him get away with murder. Colossians 2.14, the context doesn't begin at 14. If you really want to begin, it begins at 6, but we're not going to read that far back. Pay attention to the pronouns again. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Paul is not referring to everyone. He's saying to a specific group of believers, you know this is what Jesus did for us. He removed the written requirements that was against us, he nailed it to the cross. Re written requirements nailed to the cross for who? Everyone or for the us that he's writing to? That was a question. For us, yeah, this the elect. Okay, but why can Paul say he did that for us? Because if you read earlier, these are the ones who believe and were baptized. And he's saying, you who are believed and baptized know for certain that the written charges are removed for you because you believe and were baptized. Colossians 2.11 to 14. Now let's read in context. Mm -hmm. Now let's read in context. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, your flesh, 
he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the hand of writing requirements that was against us by nailing it to the cross. Where in the world do you get that Paul is saying he, he nailed the written requirements, period, end of story, when he's assuring those who've already believed, who've been baptized, made alive, note what this means for you. Because you believe, you were baptized, now know you're alive in him. You've been forgiven because those written charges against you, nailed. Oh, okay, okay. No, that's good, man. That, that's really good stuff. So where in the world does, does it say, no, it had nothing to do with faith? Yes, it had everything to do with their faith, their baptism, because it says you believe, were baptized, circumcised, made alive, raised with Christ and are forgiven. It's about a specific group of Christians who've already been saved and have received the benefits of what Jesus did. Okay, that's good. Yeah, nobody's nobody in the past has ever uh, <clears throat> unfolded it to him like this. So I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be excited for that. No, he's gonna to try to say no. It doesn't say that. I said no, Matt. It does. There's a context. <laughs> Who's the us, Matt? Paul and the Christians at Colossae, the Colossian Christians. He's not talking he's about everyone or the elect throughout the ages. He's talking to a specific group. That group were, were believers who made a profession, were baptized, were made spiritually alive because they were circumcised spiritually, raised spiritually, forgiven, and there were no written charges against them because of their union with Christ, not apart from it. Yeah, the, the thing is that he he's sharp with how he responds, but the, the reason I'm excited for you to debate him is because when you debate people, you don't let them get away with stuff, right? Yeah. There's a lot of debaters that, that brush it off, but I noticed you, man, like, you don't let anybody get away with anything. Like, you're very, you know, you're very, like, Mike Tyson type style, man. No, I don't, you know? because I, I'm sick of rhetoric. I'm sick of intimidation, bullying tactics, where they'll try to tell you the Greek and intimidate you, because that's cowardice, and it's of the devil, because you even have good Christians who can use satanic tactics unbeknownst to them. I will bully someone who's a bully or a loudmouth and blasphemer, but when it's a Christian brother or sister who loves to try on God and is being respectful, I won't do that to them. But if it's a Christian yeah. that's being a jerk, yeah, I'll do that to them. That's why I'm worried. But that's why you're butchering Paul. Paul in the context is referring to the us. This is what God did for you because of your belief and baptism. How do you separate that? You mean the context of 14 begins at 14? Let's ignore 13, 12, and 11. And let's ignore 14 begins by saying us. They're in charges against us. Not all mm -hmm. Christians in all times. Not all the elect in all times. A specific group of Christians, the Colossian Christians. Hey, guys, you who believed and baptized, you've been spiritually circumcised, raised spiritually. Know that because you believed and baptized, forgiven. No written charges against you because they've been nailed to the cross. Glory to Jesus. Mm, that's awesome, man. Uh, that's really good. I'm going to go back, watch this again. I'm also going to read verse by verse commentaries just to break it down even more. That's awesome. Yeah, in fact, you, I just, you, um, what, what's ironic? Let me show you a book that you need to get. I was just mm. seeing how this book responds, and he responds the same way. I didn't even know that. Here. I'm not gonna... Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Let me find the book. I thought I brought it here. I must have brought it. If I didn't bring it, then I'm a stupid man. Anyway, I did. I thought I brought it. Anyway, it's David W. Allen. David W. Allen. He is a thorn in James White's side. James White cannot stand him or Layton Flowers. Uh, really? Layton Flowers and David W. Allen. James White can't stand them because they're a nightmare to limited atonement because their arguments are powerful exegetically and historically. There's a book he wrote, and I had it because, and I was just looking and I was saying, I wonder what he had to say, and he said. Basically, same thing I'm saying. So that tells you, I didn't invent this. Someone really? much smarter than me, brighter than me, already said it in his book. And I just and I knew this argument before because I was thinking of Matt Slick's argument. I go, man, what a pathetic argument. Honestly, that's why I'm shocked. I'm being honest. When people are impressed by that argument, I I, I, I don't know why. I'm like, what? Come on, man. Really? The author, what, what sect is the author? Is he Catholic or is he? Uh, no, he's a Protestant. Here's the book. There's two books he wrote you guys got to get. The book where he refutes this assertion, it's in his book. And I just looked at it today in pre preparation. It's called The oh, Atonement, yeah. 
David L. Allen, A-L-L-E-N, The Atonement, a Biblical, Theological, and Historical Study of the Cross of Christ. The Atonement, a Biblical, Theological, Historical Study of the Cross of Christ. Go on Amazon.com. You'll see it. And then he wrote a massive volume. And I'm going to show you. I have that in my library. A oh. massive volume. Let me see. Let me find it. David L. Allen? David L. Allen, A-L-L-E-N. And then he wrote a massive volume called The Extent of the Atonement, a Historical and Critical Review. I think it's over 500 pages. Let me show you my copy. Oh, man. That's Get those of, books. A lot of words. Guys, if you read those books, it decimates limited atonement. Bye-bye limited atonement. No exaggeration. Give me a second. Let me find the book for you guys. We do guys, this is what we do in full time ministry and apologetics. We research, we write, we study, we analyze, we synthesize by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we have to buy tomes like this. Here you go. <laughs> do you see it? Oh, okay. Extent of the atonement. Yeah, I'm gonna write that down. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can pirate now, it. <laughs> damaged book. I damaged it because it was in my car and it rained. But look oh, how really? thick it is. Look how thick it is. Man, that's nuts, bro. Okay. That's crazy. Dr. David L. Allen and Light and Flowers, Nightmare to James White. James White can't You know how many DL shows he's done attacking this guy, mocking him? And look for him on YouTube. He's got sessions decimating limited tone. Oh, His arguments he? are airtight. Are you uh, Are you still debating James White, man? I want to watch I hope so. so badly. Now that we're on bad terms again, thanks to him, not me. He went wow. on attack. I think I would love to go to his church in Apologia and I'm and school him and Jeff Durbin on limited atonement. I may do so. Yeah, well, yeah, because you you kept a uh, long time ago. You said you couldn't wait to use Romans eight against him. Was it now, the reason 8? why I wanted to have him? Let me again, brethren, take it for what I say. I say this without saying they're not brothers in Christ. They're brothers yeah, in yeah. Christ, but as brothers in Christ, some of us have issues and some have worse issues than others. Let's be upfront. Let's be honest. James White has been used to bless me for many years, but he's followed a, followed a trend that I'm afraid for myself. Let me tell you what do I mean. I know I have anger issues. I know that. I know I'm impatient. I know that. I know I lack self-control in those areas. I know this. But telling me it and attacking me doesn't help. It triggers me. So my prayer is, Lord Jesus, sanctify me and save me. Because I have these issues, I'm afraid I'll end up like James White. James White, in the beginning, was someone I loved dearly but i noticed the pattern that over the years that he got worse and worse and worse became more arrogant more puffed up intolerable unbearable and above reproach and i fear because i'm afraid that's going to happen to me you know why because i'm not better than james white first yeah. corinthians 10 12 says as a warning first corinthians 10 12 says be careful lest you think you stand and you fall. So when I see James White, and I've seen a couple of people that I looked up to, same thing, fall because of pride, I get scared for myself. I honestly do. That's why I try to keep it as real as possible with you to let you know, look, I suck. <clears throat> I got serious issues. Pray for me that God will have mercy on me and not give me what I deserve. So with that said, James White has come, has reached a point, he's become intolerable, he's become too proud that even when he criticizes and he has a good point, you don't want to listen to him anymore because the way he approaches now, my policy, and I pray I stay truthful to this, if you're a Trinitarian, a Trinitarian who worships, loves the triumph God, you believe the Bible is the perfect word of God, you believe Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, rose physically bodily, sits in throne, king of kings, lord of lords, will return physically bodily to judge living in the dead. I will love and respect you as my brother and sister in Christ. Everything else we may disagree, I will respect and love you unless you attack me, unless you mock me, unless you're trying to embarrass me, then it's you making it personal. With James White, no. You can believe all that and still not be a brother and still he will go after you ungraciously and viciously he shows more respect and love for Muslims than he does for Trinitarians, especially Catholics. 
And, and any and any Christian who's a Protestant evangelical, any Christian Protestant who dares to question tulip or limited atonement, and he goes after them in the most vicious, ungracious manner. And when I saw how I was treating David Allen, don't take my word for it. Go to YouTube, James White, David Allen, arrogantly condescending and mocking him, insulting him, berating him, begging him to debate. And David Allen said, why would I want to debate someone who treats me like this? And he's absolutely oh. right. So I got upset for David Allen. I said, you know what? You keep running your mouth. I'll take his place and I'll debate you because another debate tactic of James White. And I'm mentioning this yeah. because you guys got to learn this. You got to oh, learn yeah. this. One of his tactics that I cannot stand, I cannot stand, he will choose what verse to debate you on and what chapter, but he oh, won't yeah. agree to debate you on a chapter that he knows will decimate his position. So he'll choose to debate you Romans 9, but he won't do Romans 11. Why not? Well, that's behind the scenes stuff. We, we don't know that type of stuff, though. You would know that. No, that's, that's, that's a fact because when's the last time? You've seen him debate Romans 11. Yeah, but like I'm saying conversation-wise, like we don't know what, what how, how you guys conversate and try to make deals happen. No, he'll happen. tell you. Don't I'll, I'll, uh, brother, you, he did it re recently, but in a different context. Oh. Let me prove it to you. I want you to go to Explain Apologetics channel. Go to Explain Apologetics channel. Go there. A couple of weeks ago, he did a talk on the received text with Stephen Boyce, another James White, and I have to say this, crony, because he, he – Idolizes James White. In the comment section, people challenged him. James Snap was there. Will you oh. debate James Snap? Go listen to his answer. Tap dance. Well, you know, me and James Snap, we have the same methodology in determining the original reading because he looks at the manuscripts. You know, I like to debate him on John 6 on soteriology. Hold on, James. What does John 6 got to do with the debate challenge? We're asking you, will you debate James Knapp on Mark 16 and Je John 7 because you claim to be an expert at textual criticism? Instead, he says, I'll debate him on John 6. What does John yeah. 6 got to do with the challenge? Mm, yeah. <laughs> I, I see your point, bro. Go listen um, to it. Go listen yeah, to I it. I pulled that channel up. I, I, I did pull that channel up. Um, I'm, I'm just curious. Um, Somebody like you, not, not knowledge-wise, but status-wise, so it can open up more doors for you to debate like Bart Ehrman. Like if you had like a, a, the, like a doctorate in the, theology, yes. for example, would that, would that enable you to yes. debate people like Bart Ehrman? Bart Ehrman won't give me the time of day because I'm not a PhD. Oh, but here's yeah. the problem. Let me tell you why. Can I guys tell you, tell you why I never went the route of getting accredited? Let me tell you why. Here's my, oh. honest to, to God, honest to the Lord. And I'm not boasting. You guys know by, because of the Holy Spirit, empowering me for the glory of Jesus, I can go in seminary and ace it, right? Just Easy, uh, yeah, yeah. glory to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> glory to the Holy Spirit. May crucify my flesh. But here's why I didn't do it. Because if I went to an institution, people say, well, he went to seminary. That's why he's knowledgeable. But when I come and tell you, I didn't even graduate high school. I didn't even graduate high school. The highest education is a GD. Never been to college, never been to university, never been to Bible college or seminary, and never had a man teach me. And then you see the knowledge, then you stand in awe of the Holy Spirit, and you praise the Holy Spirit, love the Holy Spirit, and worship Him, because then you know how powerful He is to take idiots and make them wise for the glory of Christ. Mm -hmm. So what would you yeah, rather bro. have me do? Not get a degree and people be blown away at how amazingly real the Holy Spirit is in the life of a sinner who yields. Or get a degree and get people to think it's the degree that certified me robbing Jesus of the glory that can be his. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a tough decision. but you know, like, There is uh, no tough decision. The choice no. is simple. No tough decision. Jesus, my friend. Did Peter 100%. go and get accredited by the rabbis and their schooling? No. There, it, there it just, and Peter's the rock, right? Oh yeah, I both. Well, so your Catholic God, church, <laughs> your Catholic church, boasts in an uneducated fisherman as the rock. You know what? That was a tough decision. He should have went and got certified by the Pharisees. <laughs> See the point, brother? 
Yeah, hundred percent. By the way, I I died laughing that day when that when that black guy phoned and he said he smokes weed and he has a relationship with Jesus. You like that? It's that true, black, wasn't it? Remember that? Remember that black guy? He's like, yo, I smoke. I did. I smoke some weed. Yeah. And it turned. I was right, right? I nailed it. Yeah, that was so funny, man. And then when I, I, I told him, and then I'll leave it with this unless you have a question. I said, now be honest with me. Are you telling me that Jesus showed you this connection with the black stone? He goes, yep. Dial tone. That's when you know he was still tripping, and it wasn't we. He was probably on shrooms or acid. He pointed to a false prophet to, to prove a prophecy. Dude, man, man, on this we, man, I get to see. The, look at that pretty angel. Oh man, a, oh, man, it's we, bro. I'm tripping, bro. Yeah, right. What kind of guy points to a false prophet to prove a prophecy? Even he acknowledges he's a false prophet. Man, <laughs> like, bro, but you don't understand, homie. Homie, don't know me. Don't you understand? It's medicinal weed, bro. Bro, man. It's medicinal, so it's legit and kosher. I'm I'm smoking kosher weed, baby. It's kashrut. Oh man. Yeah. All right, brother. You any more questions, brother? Because I got I'm no, gonna I'm take gonna, a one more question because I'll wrap it up. So already three hours. I'm gonna let you go, man. You probably want to crash out pretty By soon. the way, Colossians 2 14, it makes sense now. Oh, 100%. Man, you know what, man? I'm going to phone him back and be like, yo, I got some Sam Shee Moon for no, you. No, no, don't mention me, dude. Don't mention me. Just tell him so I <laughs> okay, can do okay, it. No but problem, do it. Bro. Say, man. Wait, hold on, bro. Let's go to Washington's 1 2. Explain that. Home. No, 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 Matt. Jesus made peace by the blood of his cross. He did it. It says nothing to do with faith or repentance. And he did it for all creation of heaven and earth. Universalism, Matt. Repent of your Calvinist heresy, Matt. Yeah, Matt. Maybe you need to get some medicinal. We, yeah, right. yeah, we'll, right. we'll, we'll lead him to the Ethiopian. That's right, yeah, yeah and the guy wasn't even the open, but God bless you, my brother. All right, peace, man. Take care, peace. God bless you. Okay, guys, uh, again, I'm speaking from my heart and I'm speaking honestly and forthrightly. If you take my criticisms of our brothers Matt Slick and James White as being unchrist like, you're being inconsistent, you're being a hypocrite. You know why? Go listen to the dividing line. How many Christian brothers and sisters over the years, like William Lane Craig, Craig, Leighton Flowers, has James White criticized and in a harsh, disrespectful manner? If he can do it and still be Christ-like in doing it, don't you dare point to the splinter of my eyes, remove the beams from his eyes and your own, unless you want me to call you Solowitians, because you're making him more than he is, and don't make any of us more than we are. I think I have one final question. And then it's already three hours. I hope you're still blessed. A lot of good topics. We still got over 400. Do me a favor, guys. You need to pray for me. I already get attacked by people who think they are humble and spiritual, Christ-like, for being arrogant, rude, speaking very harshly and in a nasty tone when I call blasphemers and arrogant know-it-alls, sons of the devil, spiritual bastards. Pray the Lord Jesus protect me from my flesh. Pray the Lord Jesus does not allow me to fall into pride, arrogance, and destroy my value as a tool for the glory of Jesus Christ. Pray God has mercy on people like James White. Don't wish the worst for him. That he awakens to how, how much of his own enemy he's become. Very self-destructive. May God save him. Pray the Lord Jesus will save me from falling into any scandal so I don't dishonor him. Pray the Lord Jesus gives me the health I need to serve him. Bless my daughters. Keep them healthy that if the Lord tarries, they outlive me and bring them to me. And the Lord Jesus makes us holy and provide for the ministry. I need your prayers. I try to be as transparent and honest with you to let you know my struggles because I'm afraid. I'm being honest. You think I'm kidding you. When I see these Christians who in the beginning had such fruitful ministries only to self-destruct and destroy any value they have as ministers, it scares me because I am not better than them and God can give me what I deserve. May he never give me what I deserve. Please, Lord Jesus, my Lord, my master, never give me what I deserve. Please give me your grace and favor and save me from myself. First Corinthians 10, 12. Be careful lest you think you stand and you fall. First Corinthians 10, 12. Be careful lest you think you stand and you fall. Now, folks, it's already three hours. I was going to take this call, but I can't. It's late. Sorry. I'll do it tomorrow. Lord willing, see you tomorrow. Now, let me remind you. Let me remind you. This Friday, God willing, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 
this Friday, God willing, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Brother William Albrecht will be doing a session on the early church fathers on the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mother, my Lord. He'll be compiling a series of quotes from the church fathers of the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries. Send them to me and I'll post them so you can have those citations and use them that this is what the early church fathers, these great men of faith, these lions of the faith, these holy slaves of Christ who defended orthodoxy and died as martyrs believed about the Blessed Mother of our Lord. That's Friday. Monday, don't forget, Church of Christ Evangelist, A.K. Richardson, making a biblical case that water baptism saves, showing you it's not just Catholics, the Syrian Church of the East, the Coptics, or the Orthodox that believe it. And he's going to quote the verses and address those passages often used to show that baptism is not salvific. That will be next Monday, God willing. And that will be at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow. I love you for the sake of Jesus. Pray for me if you love me, that I remain in love with the Lord. And the Lord never let me go and give me what I deserve and bless my daughters and bring them to me. My youngest daughter, her birthday, October 26, and I won't be there. Another man named Martin will be there. Pray against that and pray the Lord will bring them to me. Please, my God, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. I love you for the sake of the Lord. I hope you're blessed. Take care.